Global investors from Kenya, the United States, the United Kingdom, South Africa and other countries arrived in Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, for the second leg of the Kenya and DRC Investors Roadshow that started in Nairobi. The charter jet touched down at Njili International Airport early morning for the delegates to begin a two-day mission of meetings and tour of enterprises in and around the city. Speaking at the plenary session of the meeting in the DRC capital, IFC Managing Director Malik Fall said the DRC is a victim of an image that it shed many years ago. Aujourd'hui, deux ans après, nous avons euh, multiplié par cinq les effectifs de la SFI ici au Congo. Nous doublons chaque année nos investissements dans ce pays et nous sommes encore loin du compte. Tellement les opportunités sont importantes dans ce pays. Equity BCDC Managing Director Celestine Mukabu said challenges facing DRC are opportunities for investment, particularly in energy, mining and agriculture. The country is divided in five economic regions. We have uh, the West region where we have the Kinshasa town. It's already more than 15 million inhabitants. There is a lot of trade happening, especially when you want to do manufacturing. It's something which could be considered. Still to the West, there is an agriculture potential. So the food basket of Kinshasa is just near. More in the South, there are uh, the mineral region where there is most of the mining activities happening there. You have huge concentration of different mineral and in, in the DRC. We have two time zones. This is the West time zones. But in the east, we have another time zone. It's plus one. So if you want to manage operations and to start, you could start it depending on your activity in the west, or you can start in the south, or you can start closer to the east region, uh, where there is a lot of activities as well going there. Mukabu said equity BCDC customer base has crossed the 2 million mark and is poised to grow even further because the country is lowly banked. The country is not yet fully digitalized, so that is an area where somebody could explore and see it as an opportunity. Although the DRC is known for its mining potential, the ecosystems to the sector, including food supply, housing, transport, roads, and energy, remain largely untapped. On agro-industrial sector, this is an enormous opportunity. The land is very fertile. Last time we saw some uh, maize growing in the bridge, and you could see across the bridge there was maize. Nobody has planted it, but it was growing. So the land is so fertile and uh, it gives an opportunity of starting growing food. And the, the country used to be in the past, before the period of instability, a food basket in many aspects. Kenyan ambassador to DRC, George Masafu, said the Kenya fraternity was proud of equity, which he said has become the face of Kenyan enterprises in the country. We are so proud to host the cream of the Kenyan uh, investors coming to DRC. And this could not have been possible without the leadership of James and his team. James, we are very proud of your leadership for organizing this kind of tour to DRC. Equity Bank is now flying the flag. It is the face of Kenyan enterprise in DRC. What does it mean now for you investors who have come to DRC? Visiting DRC means you are looking for opportunities to invest. And you cannot come to a country to invest if you have no confidence in that country. It's an expression of confidence in this country and why you want to invest here. The visitors were surprised by the opportunities in various sectors and were keen to find a niche in the country that is arguable.
Global investors from Kenya, the United States, the United Kingdom, South Africa and other countries arrived in Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, for the second leg of the Kenya and DRC Investors Roadshow that started in Nairobi. The chartered jet touched down at Njili International Airport early morning for the delegates to begin a two-day mission of meetings and tour of enterprises in and around the city. Speaking at the plenary session of the meeting in the DRC capital, IFC Managing Director Malik Fall said the DRC is a victim of an image that it shared many years ago. Some, uh... Aujourd'hui, deux ans après, nous avons euh, multiplié par cinq les effectifs de la SFI ici au Congo. Nous doublons chaque année nos investissements dans ce pays et nous sommes encore loin du compte. Tellement les opportunités sont importantes dans ce pays. Equity BCDC Managing Director Celestine Mukabu said challenges facing DRC are opportunities for investment, particularly in energy, mining and agriculture. The country is divided in five economic regions. We have uh, the West region where we have the Kinshasa town. It's already more than 15 million inhabitants. There is a lot of trade happening, especially when you want to do manufacturing. It's something which could be considered. Still to the West, there is an agriculture potential. So the food basket of Kinshasa is just near. More in the South, they are uh, the mineral region where there is most of the mining activities happening there. You have huge concentration of different mineral and in, in the DRC. We have two time zones. This is the West time zones. But in the east, we have another time zone. It's plus one. So if you want to manage operations and to start, you could start it depending on your activity in the west, or you can start in the south, or you can start closer to the east region, uh, where there is a lot of activities as well going there. Mukabu said equity BCDC customer base has crossed the 2 million mark and is poised to grow even further because the country is lowly banked. The country is not yet fully digitalized, so that is an area where somebody could explore and see it as an opportunity. Although the DRC is known for its mining potential, the ecosystems to the sector, including food supply, housing, transport, roads, and energy, remain largely untapped. On agro industrial sector, this is an enormous opportunity. The land is very fertile. Last time we saw some uh, maize growing in the bridge, and you could see across the bridge, there was maize. Nobody has planted it, but it was growing. So the land is so fertile and uh, it gives an opportunity of starting growing food. And the, the country used to be in the past, before the period of instability, a food basket in many aspects. Kenyan ambassador to DRC, George Masafu, said the Kenya fraternity was proud of equity, which he said has become the face of Kenyan enterprises in the country. We are so proud to host the cream of the Kenyan uh, investors coming to DRC. And this could not have been possible without the leadership of James and his team. James, we are very proud of your leadership for organizing this kind of tour to DRC. Equity Bank is now flying the flag. It is the face of Kenyan enterprise in DRC. What does it mean now for you investors who have come to DRC? Visiting DRC means you are looking for opportunities to invest. And you cannot come to a country to invest if you have no confidence in that country. It's an expression of confidence in this country and why you want to invest here.
The visitors were surprised by the opportunities in various sectors and were keen to find a niche in the country that is arguably the most sought after investment destination. A visit by several delegates to a construction site revealed the insatiable demand for housing in the city. Parkland is located in Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, we see a great future for Parkland and other construction companies because there's so much potential um, in Kinshasa. Real estate development is on the up and up um, and we believe there is a lot to come in that space. Congo is still a very virgin country in terms of opportunities. We really appreciate uh, um, Equity Bank for this opportunity because we've been able to, to, to see Congo in a very different uh, way uh, in terms of the opportunities that are in this country, especially uh, in the area of mining. Rather the interest that, um, that I have, the reason I'm here, there is a lot of uh, opportunities uh, based even for the meeting that we had. We can be able to um, live a lot of uh, opportunities in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of mining, agriculture, and the general construction. The kind of imports that this country has from food, you know, everything that you see around even at the hotel looks uh, imported and not locally manufactured. Um, so a lot of op opportunities for people who are willing to invest in local manufacturing. There's a lot of uh, potential in this country though there may be a bit of challenges, uh, maybe on the infrastructure and such things, but this is a country with uh, a lot of um, uh, potential. I'm also thankful to Equity Group um, for having managed um, to arrange uh, this roadshow, which has been um, a, big, um, a big source of um, information um, to investors and also to um, um, government technical people um, to just compare how the places are and um, uh, we are thankful to have participated. The 2023 Kenya and DRC Investors Roadshow started in Nairobi to run through Kinshasa to end in Lubumbashi to the south of the country. The Democratic Republic of Congo imports 80% of all food consumed in the vast country. It is no wonder then that agriculture and related industries present a growing opportunity for business. Deputy Governor of Katanga Jean-Claude Kamfwa told delegates on the Kenya and DRC Investors Roadshow that agriculture is now priority area for investment in alignment with other sectors such as mining. La province du Haut Katanga qui vous reçoit s'étend sur une superficie de 132425 km2 et sa population à majorité jeune et en plein accroissement. Elle est baignée par plusieurs cours d'eau importants et par le lac Mouero. En plus de ses richesses minérales variées, elle regorge des terres arables très fertiles qui se prêtent à plusieurs types de cultures. The deputy governor thanked Equity for leading enterprises to DRC by example of investing in DRC and organizing for others to follow suit. Distinguished invités, mesdames et messieurs, par l'objet de sa mission, la délégation voudrait visiter divers clients et marchés en vue d'établir des relations d'affaires, des relations commerciales qui certainement contribueront au renforcement des relations entre nos deux pays, à savoir la République démocratique du Congo et le Kenya. Equity Group Holdings Chairman Professor Isaac Masharia said the mission had brought to DRC an assortment of people, including entrepreneurs and economic analysts, to open their eyes to the opportunities available. We, as Equity Bank, 
have uh, identified the opportunities that are available in this uh, very rich province. That is why we've taken uh, uh, this step of coming with our investors, coming with uh, businessmen from Kenya, and also coming from, uh, with international analysts who write about uh, our business uh, in BCDC. Equity Group Director of Strategy Brent Malahe illustrated the need to bridge gaps that have persisted in Africa. As Equity Group we appreciate in the country like the DRC despite the abundance of natural resources in agriculture the crop yields that the DRC produces is around 40 percent of the world average whether it's maize, soy, it is well below average and Equity Group with its partners is looking to improve that. DRC has over 80 million hectares of arable land but only 10 percent is utilized. Some of the delegates had an opportunity to witness agricultural production at Gokongo Farm located 60 kilometers northeast of Lubumbashi. Gokongo, established only a decade ago, has over 60,000 heads of cattle and thousands of hectares and maize, soya and wheat. The chaff and other waste from harvested crop is used as feedstock for the cattle that produces quality beef for an insatiable domestic market. Our strategy is to grow food locally. The DRC imports around 80% of its food requirements and we've set up this farm to substitute that consumption through locally produced food. We're at about 8,000 hectares and we're producing about 25,000 tons of maize a year. Uh, about 2,000 tons of wheat a year and about 1,500 tons of soya a year. While the maize goes for milling, sifting to produce the package to a flour mill, all the wheat produced at Go Congo is used for making biscuits in the company's bakery in Lubumbashi. Our product is called Twiga. It's a maize meal. It's in a yellow bag which you'll see around town. We distribute it to over 2,000 shops and uh, we have two formats. We have a 25 kilo bag and a 2.5 kilo bag. We are banking with equity. We are very proud customers. Equity puts their money where their mouth is. They want to promote agriculture. They are promoting us. They are growing with us. They are helping us grow. And we are very proud to be their customers and to work together with them. Congo is clearing more land to plant more grain of which it hopes to grow by irrigation on large scale. When the Kenya and DRC Investors Roadshow came to a close, the delegates expressed their satisfaction that the outing helped to open their eyes to know the country better and see opportunities to invest in as well as establish alliances with the Congolese for a win-win partnerships. The journey began in 2021 when Equity Group handpicked Renko Africa and a few others to venture into the DRC for investment purposes. Saying the slogan energy for all, ensuring every household uh, access energy uh, affordably, conveniently, and in a manner that it can contribute uh, to enhancement of their quality of life. Schneider Electric Vice President Gwenel Avis Hewitt said the partnership is an enabler for the youth to access energy for innovation and relevant skills for their livelihood. In this project, we mixed our strengths uh, to be uh, on the field with uh, the team of, uh, of this bank, everywhere, close to the people, to contribute to uh, innovation, to have new solutions. We have to work very differently in the future, to have new innovation and so on. It's why the transfer of skills 
link to PLC investor briefing for full year results and if you allow me we want to start by inviting uh, sister Teresa to open for us with a word of prayer and then we will invite uh, the equity team to lead us with the uh, equity anthem while the rest of us will be seated kindly sister Teresa I'm going to read Exodus 33, 12 to 15. When God called Moses to deliver the Israelites, Moses wanted the Lord to give him a sign that, that he will be with them on the way. God replied to Moses, prayer. His request for a sign by saying, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. God offered something better than guidance. He promised to be their guide. He promised to accompany them, to be with them. When, when we walk in God's presence, we cannot fail, we cannot stumble. He renews our strength each and every day of our lives. He makes known to us the parts of life his presence, his fullness of joy is there with us each and every time. We can only have true rest and joy in the knowledge that God is going to be with us every step of our way. And we echo the words of 1 Thessalonians 5 to 18. In every circumstances, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We gather today to give thanks to God. He has blessed us with our customers, with us who are investors. Where we are, we give thanks to him in every circumstances. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of this day. We thank you for what you have done to us for the past year. We thank you for each one of us. We thank you for investors. We thank you for our customers. We thank you for our leadership. We thank you for equity family. We thank you for everything that you have done for us. We will always praise you and honor your holy name. As we plan ahead, we pray for your guidance and for your presence. We pray for your strength. We pray for our, fam for our families. We pray for equity group that you may bless each one of us you may place all that you have in invested in us. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
investors, analysts, colleagues. Uh, We're privileged to have you this morning. We're delighted to be with you this early morning as uh, we look back to the year 2023 and um, seeing how we performed, what drew for the performance. I want to acknowledge uh, the presence of our group chair, Professor Masharia. Thank you, Professor Masharia. Uh, for joining us uh, and being with us uh, this morning. Um, 2023 was a very unique uh, year for Equity Group. Over the last uh, five years, 
when making our investors uh, our presentations and briefing, we have been pulling together the thematic pillars that uh, were driving transformation of equity group uh, and updating investors as to where we are. For the first time, uh, we'll be presenting uh, the unified uh, formation uh, that equity group has become uh, because uh, of executing consistently a very strong strategic plan codenamed the African Recovery and Resilient Plan and positioning ourselves and adapting ourselves to the needs of that plan. And so what we see is an organization fit for purpose to drive, to execute the African Recovery uh, and Resilient Plan. This is an African transformation of plan where equity group has chosen to provide leadership, a actor facilitator, and a catalyst for change by empowering Africans to drive the transformation themselves. We are using financial tools to enable people to play their role. It's an innovative way of uh, private sector playing to uh, the development agenda. Equity is using two engines, an economic engine uh, composed of banking services, insurance services, technology, uh, technology services, while at the same time having a social engine that capacitate and de-risk to enable everybody to play and to guarantee inclusion as we transform our continent, ensuring nobody is um, left behind. So if you see a difference in format, it's because we now can see visibly what equity has become uh, through the intention. That phase of the last seven years though characterized by very significant uh, shocks, equity has demonstrated great resilience and has managed to transform itself. But before we really go into uh, the performance, let's look at uh, the environment. And if you look at the global or uh, macro environment, we see higher for longer interest rates and slow a gradual rate cuts by major central banks. We have been waiting for cut of interest rates. It's coming slow. We are of the view that maybe we'll see the first cuts in the fourth quarter, but we are encouraged. Switzerland has become the first country uh, to start uh, cutting the interest rates, confirming evidently uh, not just by the absence of uh, three quarters uh, without uh, the Fed touching on the interest, on interest rates that maybe the movement is here with us. The prediction is that 2024, uh, we might end up with the Fed rate being at uh, 4.6, assuming approximately two uh, cuts and uh, adding up Hope of rate 2026 with approximately 3% interest rates. And we have seen uh, the period that we have gone through, how challenging it has been when the effective interest rates are high. But we have seen the inflation has started showing uh, signs of being tamed, but stubbornly uh, remaining uh, high at above uh, an average 3% across um, the world. When we come to Africa, uh, in the midst of all this, Africa has emerged, uh, and specifically East Africa, has emerged as one of the fastest growing regions in the world. In the top uh, 10 countries, we have Tanzania and Rwanda 
as two of uh, the fastest growing countries. If we expand that to uh, 20 countries, Uganda joins the rank, and if you extend to 50, then you get uh, Kenya, DRC, and South Sudan joining the rank, making, uh, uh, giving uh, a, a region of whose countries are all in the top 50 uh, fastest growing uh, um, countries. And again, that uh, shows the momentum. When you look at uh, the characteristics, then you see maybe this growth will be sustained for a long time. Why? Because it's uh, fueled by foreign direct investments, and the region has become the second uh, largest recipient of foreign direct uh, investment uh, on the African continent. When you look uh, deeper, you see the ability of the region to integrate uh, with the global markets, the ease of raising euro bonds so that capital flows beyond foreign direct investments uh, can be market uh, made. But more importantly, we also see uh, the resource base, whether it's agricultural, uh, lad, whether it's uh, strategic minerals, and whether it's readiness to support uh, the centralization and the globalization uh, by becoming a new hub. We see a significant uh, upside opportunity as a result in East Africa, and we feel Equity Group uh, Holdings is uniquely positioned to step into this growth, not just to, uh, to drive this growth, but to benefit itself, to be fully transformed, and to significantly reward uh, its stakeholders. May they be staff, may they be shareholders, may they be depositors, may they be readers. It's not just Tanzania and Rwanda are among the top fastest growing countries, but a country like Tanzania is showing a possibility of very high ceiling in terms of opportunity for growth. Uh, the gas fights in Tanzania, the agricultural potential of uh, Tanzania, the infrastructure development of standard gauge railway lines in Tanzania uh, gives it uh, the impactors uh, that uh, will be necessary. When you look at the entire region, 63% of the entire population of nearly 380 million is below the age of 24. So if you take that as a consumer, it's a consumer that uh, can be a customer for the next eight years, given modern science and uh, modern medicine. Uh, and uh, the fact that um, uh, our lifespan within the region is growing. More interestingly is the median age of the region is below 19 and aging between 15 and 19. Again, affirming uh, what uh, may be demographic uh, dividends uh, that would come from the region. Again, DRC stands out. Whether you talk about energy potential, clean energy, whether you talk about uh, strategic green minerals uh, to power uh, clean uh, energy technologies, whether you talk about hydro, whether you talk about Alabolad, uh, DRC stands out. And of course, when you look at uh, the financial sector, banking has done well, penetration is reasonable, uh, but insurance uh, penetration is still uh, at the age of 1%, and the headroom of 99 gives us a huge opportunity as a group uh, uh, to grow. This is a legion that has adopted technology, and if you look at uh, the mobile penetration, and particularly if we single on Kenya, which mirror the other countries, we have 124% penetration. We have more mobile phones than um, the population, uh, than uh, suggesting that uh, adoption of modern technologies. But it's not just uh, this um, legion is endowed, but this region has proactively positioned itself uh, to be an ecosystem of trade connections. 
This is the most integrated uh, region uh, on the African continent. Uh, the common trade area uh, has uh, really been adopted. And if you look uh, closely, you see uh, Uganda is uh, Kenya's largest trading partner. And you can see Tanzania is not far. Rwanda is not far. And we can see the countries are trading with each other. When Kenya exports $820 million to, uh, of exports to Uganda, uh, Uganda also exports $601 million. To, so it is inter um, uh, cross border trade at another level. And this is the region that is likely to make the African uh, free continental trade area viable. And to set the example, of what it is. Given the equity bank in that region is number one or number two in four of the countries, and particularly the two largest economies, Kenya and DLC, it demonstrates how well equity group holding is, the, is at the heart of East African driving ecosystem of trade connections. And equity has been proactive are facilitating trade missions uh, in between these countries to make it a common market and ensure our business people uh, are, are faced by a 380 million people market other than the country population. We can zero on on DLC and see the largest country in sub-Saharan Africa also presents a new and exciting frontier of continued sustain, uh, sustainable growth for equity group holdings. And this is what we're saying. Strategy has been positioning equity uh, to be at the center and the heart of this form, uh, formidable transformation that is happening before our eyes. I'm pleased to um, inform you that equity is 27% of the entire banking industry in DLC. What it means is that for uh, every 10 customers uh, in DLC, three are in equity bank. That's broadly what it means, or the value of transaction for the banking industry. And uh, in the midst of what we have just talked about, the endowment of DLC, uh, then we see how well um, uh, equity is positioned to be a catalyst of transformation whether it's value addition in the mineral resources, whether it's in the agricultural transformation of the world powerhouse, uh, whether it's in development of energy, hydro, uh, whether it's the headquarters of equity being in Kenya strategically positions as at, at uh, the gateway of entering East Africa. Kenya's elevation in terms of, of human skills, um, Kenya's elevation in terms of social investment, uh, particularly energy, uh, education and health, a very skilled uh, human capital, a functioning civil uh, service, elevated uh, infrastructure development, interconnectedness with the landlocked countries, uh, position equities headquarters at the core uh, and at the center of what things will happen. So I would call it strategic uh, uh, position, positioning. We're also very impressed with the reforms, the governance and institutional reforms taking place uh, in Kenya and DRC particularly, and the transformation we are seeing in, in uh, Uganda, Rwanda, uh, Tanzania, Uganda. So. Each of the market is at a different level of transformation, and we trust that uh, will be uh, really uh, give us a very unique positioning and a unique opportunity uh, really now, now to benefit uh, from the transformation happening before our eyes. If we look at uh, equity specific as a group, uh, equity has now emerged as um, a premier regional financial service provider. It's no longer uh, the Kenyan 
banking um, uh, leader, we see uh, that uh, there is significant uh, transformation. And we can see the impact uh, in terms of uh, uh, what uh, equity has become. A 1.8 trillion balance sheet uh, that tells you uh, the largest uh, uh, regional uh, banking customer base, branch network, deposit base, um, with uh, very efficient operations, cost income ratio of 52. We see um, organic and uh, fast tracking that through mergers and acquisition. And we can talk about the latest uh, acquisition in Rwanda that has converted equity uh, in Rwanda to be an 18% market share uh, financial group in that country. So, so when you look at 27% market share in DRC, 18% market share in Rwanda, 14% market share in Kenya, then it speaks of how significant um, equity has become. Despite all these and being the largest uh, balance sheet, we see uh, the uh, group continuing to grow, uh, deposit growing at 29%, speaking to the customer's uh, preference of equity bank. Deposits is a choice of the customers who to deposit with, and when your deposit grow at 29% during difficult, turbulent uh, period, then uh, it means the BRAD is not just uh, celebrated as the strongest banking BRAD in Africa, second strongest BRAD by, uh, in the world, but the customer growth uh, in terms of deposit uh, acts as a huge testimony. But equity also uh, has been prudent. Uh, it doesn't say uh, the times are difficult, the risks are too high. As we can see, it grows leading at 26% when we are dealing with high inflation um, uh, rates or very challenging macroeconomic times. Equity doesn't avoid the risks. It manages the risk. And we can see it never abandons the customer. And for that reason that it has created a symbiotic relationship, a trusting relationship with the customers. And that is what uh, guarantees equity, that even during difficult times, it can still have uh, equity and a return of 22.3%. Um, significant uh, return above market rate because of the confidence. When you look at our customer human capital and Brad, as we have said, uh, we take pride uh, of uh, being the owners of the strongest banking Brad on the African continent. Second strongest banking Brad on earth. We take pride because that is a reflection of who we are, who, what people say we are, how people regard us, and how people hold us. Um, and that is because of who we are. That speaks of our governance structures. That speaks of the quality of our human capital. That speaks of our systems and our processes. But more importantly, speaks of our governance structures that build, partake to this growth. And forever we'll be grateful to the shareholders for giving us 5% uh, of uh, the value of the bank as staff so that as we work for the shareholders, we work for ourselves. We are aligned in interest. We give our all, all, uh, our all because we are beneficiaries of what uh, the customer's uh, uh, generosity uh, has been. So the governance and organizational structure continues to attract uh, breadth and depth of management team and uh, an organization can never be better than the quality of its people. And we take pride that uh, we are the best uh, second blood on earth because we have uh, some of the best uh, human capital anywhere in the world. Uh, we have uh, 26 nationalities in our executive management reflecting a blood that has a universal acceptance 
uh, across um, the board. Very strong governance structures uh, to manage the risks and to manage uh, uh, accountability, to hold people to account and to ensure a mechanism of cross-checking each other, both at uh, the strategic level and at uh, operational level. As a result, we have been able to build a sustainable financial ecosystem. Uh, we have been talking about it, uh, but now we have the banking group uh, in six countries and a rep office on, uh, the in the seventh for, for its doors to open, knowing that Ethiopia is one of the top fastest growing economies in the world. We have equity insurance group uh, projecting by the end of uh, June to have uh, a life insurance, a general insurance, and a health insurance, complete, completing the entire offering of health so that uh, we can, pro uh, we can um, protect lives, we can protect health, but more or equally important to protect the wealth that we have helped to build uh, so that um, the, uh, our growth becomes sustainable. And of course, we all know about Equity Group Foundation, which has become increasingly bigger and that is shaping the, the blood of the group. And now equity has evolved uh, from the brick and mortar infrastructure uh, to now uh, be on a technology platform uh, that uh, has allowed us uh, to digitize our business, to become an online business, to compress uh, time and distance, and more importantly, to give our customers uh, the power of control of uh, their money. Uh, uh, they do bank, they onboard themselves, they navigate on the platform, and they consume the products they wish to consume uh, across uh, the four gr uh, groupings. This has then uh, led to uh, positioning ourselves to grow with the East Africa to of tomorrow. We truly believe that uh, if East Africa is uh, the fastest growing region in the world, the East Africa of tomorrow will look very different from the East Africa of today. And uh, we take pride that uh, we took uh, a proactive um, strategic decision uh, to position ourselves at the heart of that entire region. And now we have strategically positioned ourselves uh, to grow, uh, to be the bank of the East African of tomorrow. With the largest capital base in the region, the largest customer base, the largest balance sheet, and being systemic in all the countries in the region, uh, being in the top uh, uh, four countries except one, it shows how uh, equity has positioned itself to drive uh, and to benefit uh, from that unique uh, position and the opportunity of rapid growth. So uh, equity has also equally transformed itself into a unique fi uh, financial services uh, platform with exposure uh, to, uh, to attract East African market. So it's no longer uh, focusing on one country, it's looking and recognizing the opportunity that uh, the East Africa of tomorrow will generate, will create, and saying we want to be in the driver's seat, we want to be a catalyst, we want to be an enabler, and we want to have the capacity and competence. And equities uh, credentials have been proved by the last uh, um, seven years, uh, since 2016, when we went uh, through uh, the interest cra uh, capping uh, challenge or shock, went to COVID, went to Ukraine last, uh, last year war, we went uh, all through uh, to disruption of global supply chains, uh, we went through the current macro, and yet equity is emerging stronger, resilient, 
uh, than ever before. I want to pay tribute uh, to our team of uh, LISC uh, uh, leaders uh, who really have uh, kept us uh, true uh, to our conviction uh, that LISC need to be proactively managed, uh, LISC need to be uh, managed through governance structures, uh, policies and procedures, and LISC management is, an, is a catcher. It's not uh, just uh, transactional, it's a catcher of decision making, of behavior, and uh, we are very uh, grateful that we are able to do. So the high growth potential in the markets um, our, co uh, our banking group serves, or the entire group serves, uh, again, shows the size, whether it's the domestic credit, uh, what is the opportunity. And if you look at the opportunity in private uh, uh, sector lending, uh, it's enormous. Kenya has the highest uh, um, uh, penetration, 31%, but from that 1%, we go straight to Rwanda at uh, 23, uh, Tanzania 15, Uganda 13, DRC 17, and South Sudan 3, showing the headroom, the opportunity, and maybe the length of the, uh, the runway uh, or um, the height of the city um, that uh, provides us with the opportunity. When you look at uh, banking account penetration, uh, Kenya with 86%, followed by Uganda at 60, Rwanda 56, Tanzania. All this data confirms the East African region is a growth region for financial um, services. And again, when you look at uh, our position, position one in South Sudan, position one or two in Rwanda, DRC, and Kenya, and uh, position five in Uganda, and uh, position 13 out of 54 in Tanzania. 9% return on equity, 26 in Kenya, DRC 21, high earning assets. And as we, uh, then you can see, in all this story, we see loan to asset ratio is at 45%. And we believe we cannot optimize profitability at anything between 75 and 85% loan to deposit ratio, meaning DRC can double its profitability at the present size, uh, simply by allocating cash uh, into loan book. And that is the opportunity that we all need to see. Tanzania, another uh, high potential market uh, where we are low, uh, 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 smallest uh, in size, but uh, with the greatest potential. But we can see its potential that we are unlocking Revenue growth 32%, asset 32%. So there is a direct correlation uh, in each of the parameters. You grow asset 32%, revenue grow at 32%, and uh, you get um, that level uh, between uh, uh, the countries, Uganda. And when you go to Tanzania, 29, 26. So the efficiency of operations, the execution uh, power, which this group is known for, uh, is at play, and that is what has completed the picture. So the new frontiers for growth uh, in the banking for equity then becomes, uh, again, Rwanda, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about Rwanda when we celebrate uh, the acquisition and merger that happened in the last six months uh, of last year giving us uh, a market share of 18% uh, of the entire market. Uh, Rwanda, one of the uh, uh, 10 fastest growing economies um, in, in the world. So the picture would not be complete if we were not to look at the asset quality, distribution and mitigation, uh, uh, the own book growth, which is in the next uh, slide, uh, it's good to look at the earning asset mix and how well it is. Uh, we have achieved almost the same mix in all the countries, whether it's Kenya, uh, BCDC, the NIMS, the return on asset, 
to just give the investors uh, transparency so that you can really be able to frame. But uh, if you look at uh, the slowest growth is happening in Kenya, 4%, D, uh, DRC 67, Uganda 25, South Sudan 56. You may be thinking uh, South Sudan is unsafe. A loan book is growing at 56. Uh, Rwanda at 92%, uh, giving the group at 26%. A distributed growth. There is no concentration. And truly, that's why we said um, it's an East African risk. It's no longer a Kenyan risk. I always see us being tied to the macros in Kenya, but we should be tied to the macros of the six fastest growing countries in the world. Uh, and when you look at uh, them, Kenya is not. But when you get priced, we are priced on Kenya. Yet, the uh, DRC is where we have 27% uh, of the market share. Rwanda is where we have 18% uh, of the entire market share. Kenya is only 13%. We are not a Kenyan risk uh, bank uh, or group. Uh, we are a regional risk uh, uh, group. So it's very well distributed. Again, a uh, tribute um, uh, to the uh, risk team, uh, manual leading us in credit. Our NPLs, as we promised uh, last time, uh, we believed it had peaked. As at September, we are 12.2. Uh, we are down to 11.7 and we believe we will sustain a downward trend, a downward uh, improvement in the quality of the loan book. It again demonstrates our credit team, uh, led by Manuel McDair, that they fully understand this risk. They promised in September, they have delivered uh, in December, I hope they you also deliver in March. Confirmed, so the decline has started and that to me is, but it's the coverage that gives me courage, the prudence, the conservative management uh, uh, style in the organization that uh, despite um, showing improvement, the bank decided uh, not to carry the risk of this NPL into the future and uh, bring it to this year and uh, as we saw, uh, this is the highest provisions we have ever made uh, in the history of Equity Bank. 32.8 billion. Not because the loan is deteriorating, but because you want to uh, properly apply IFRS 9 provisioning, taking the entire lifetime uh, risk in a loan uh, during a, a, a performance year. And so we chose that uh, we leave the challenges of the difficult times behind by ensuring we have fully provided uh, for uh, the loan book. And that gives us the coverage that we are seeing, very high coverage uh, of 90% uh, when you combine actual provision and uh, the guarantees. Again, you can prudence again uh, segment to distribution of their own. It's corporate, SMEs, uh, personal, uh, and uh, detail. A fair distribution. Again, uh, geography. We see Kenya, the oldest subsidiary, only 51%. DRC, 32% of their own. So you can see the correlation between uh, and the parity between deposit and loans and consequently size of the risk and distribution uh, within um, the region. But uh, I don't think the picture is, co not, is complete without saying it's not that we are managing the loan well, but relative to the industry, our NPLs are at 11.7 when the industry is at 14.8, and we have the, uh, the best uh, coverage in the market. We, we Again, that uh, talks about uh, the defensive approach management uh, uh, uses uh, prudently provide. 
And of course, uh, the potential, the hidden opportunity is uh, in uh, the treasury efficiency. 40% of the entire balance sheet, actually more than 40%. We're talking about uh, 1.8 trillion balance sheet, but 500 billion is in government securities. That is the biggest opportunity, that you could be able to reallocate this to credit and increase the earnings, the yields, the margins by nearly 60%. And given that the East African region is the fastest growing, the opportunity to alloc uh, uh, reallocate is not a constraint uh, because the market is growing, the region is growing, the demand uh, of the market um, is uh, pretty high. So we have packed this. Uh, we can see how efficient trade has been done. And I want uh, to really thank our team, uh, Treasury team, trade finance team, led by Shisha. Shisha, maybe you could wave, uh, group treasurer, the Kenyan treasurer, Daniel Gashau, uh, Kennedy treasurer. That team has done an amazing job to look after 40% of the entire balance sheet, and not just look at it after it uh, and manage it well. As we said, the headwinds um, uh, seems to be breaking. We can see the market, mark to market, uh, uh, the improvement as that uh, if September we were 88 billion, as at uh, December, we are at 55 billion, we are now below uh, 49, and we have seen the yields on the euro bonds uh, below 10, uh, suggesting that uh, by the uh, end of uh, March 2024, uh, that uh, number will improve. Remember that mark to market is uh, passed through a comprehensive income, it's netted of against our capital. So if you are uh, computing net asset, please add another 50 billion to net asset uh, to do actual valuation of um, uh, the bank. And we look at trade finance, Kennedy seems not to be in the room. Uh, that's the team that uh, has demonstrated that uh, equity has uh, gone up the, uh, the value chain. Uh, our fastest growing product or tool uh, is trade finance, again confirming the interconnectedness uh, uh, of East African community, the economic activities on the trade routes. Trade finance uh, revenue grew at 90%, but uh, trade finance related uh, lending 106. Uh, I was amazed when we took our 300 uh, 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 traders uh, uh, to DLC. After two months, they had given us an opportunity to fund them 2.1 billion US dollars of facilities. That is what uh, is reflected here. Uh, the cross border trade, um, the interconnectedness, we talked of um, the trade connection between the countries, uh, it's a huge opportunity. And you can see trade finance guarantee and off balance sheet items again making it easier for uh, our traders. And of course, uh, when you look at uh, profit, uh, the interest margin edging up uh, as we move money uh, from government stock to uh, lending, uh, the yields edging up, cost of funds again uh, looks like we said ha has peaked and has started to show early signs of decline from 3.9 to 3.8. And when you look at uh, the yields on loans, uh, relative to the market, uh, we seem to be doing pretty well. 12.7, uh, enhancing when the industry is coming down. It was slow, and I may say this, uh, because uh, the top line in equity will see that interest income is growing much slower than interest expense. We couldn't shield ourselves from uh, interest expense, but there is a segment of uh, Kenyans we said we would not pass uh, the interest expense. 
beginning of last year, uh, we, our risk-based lending was approved. We could have adjusted consumer lending, salary uh, and payroll uh, salaries, but we chose not to subject Kenyan workers to the headwinds. The payroll lending, consumer lending, if you call it, constitutes 32% of our entire loan book. Anybody who had borrowed as at January last year, they are still paying at 13%. When if you borrow today, you pay 24%. That is the general heart of Equity Bank. When we talk about caring financial partner, equity practices what it says. And so when you hold 32% of the entire loan book at 13, when you hold 50%, 500 billion, 40% of the balance sheet at 11%, it means 70% of earning assets earning below 13%. Weighted average between treasury boards and consumer loans is 11%. But we are funding that uh, loan book at deposit at 18%. And that explains to you why you'll see uh, cost of funds, we are above the market at 18%. Uh, yields, we are below because uh, of uh, subsidizing consumers. Uh, but we take pride that uh, uh, the civil servants, the teachers, uh, the salaried people are able to take care of their families because equity has stood with them during these high inflationary times and when the Kenya shilling has uh, shown uh, signs of weakening against uh, the dollar. It's something we take pride of. Uh, it's what the foundation then takes to the next level, uh, and uh, we all know what Equity Group is doing. As we earlier said, equity is not just banking like it used to be in Kenya. It's now a financial group. Um, insurance is promising to be as big as uh, the bank, and we see uh, the opportunity in insurance. In East Africa, our penetration is only 1.34. This is where banking was uh, in the 80s. And as we saw, we disrupted that, and now 86% of all Kenyans are included or have bank accounts. This is the opportunity equity is chasing to see to it that inclusion reaches 50% uh, in the next um, five years. So when we talk confidently that uh, the insurance group will rival uh, the banking group, it's because of this uh, opportunity. Low average insurance pen penetration uh, and consumers in Africa uh, are in financial distress, we all know. We insure ourselves through social group, families, prot, and uh, such things. We think like we uh, disrupted banking, we shall disrupt insurance. And we disrupt insurance as we think by making insurance accessible, relevant and suitable, affordable, and uh, bringing trust that uh, uh, its insurance is reliable and dependable than we think. And uh, that explains why we have taken a very challenging uh, tagline for our insurance group, the insurance you can trust because we want to be challenged on trust. And it's only by breaking uh, the barrier of trust that we believe insurance uh, will take off um, in this uh, region. So we are taking a three-pronged approach to insurance, protecting life, uh, protecting health, and protecting wealth. We work very hard. We all service our cars every three months. We want everybody to service themselves uh, through a health wellness program covered by insurance, but when an incident comes, uh, then uh, there is, uh, we don't pay out of pocket, uh, but insurance pays. Uh, by collectively uh, bearing the burden, 
we can make the burden very light for each of us, bringing affordability uh, to insurance, distribute insurance adequately, the supply side. And I'm glad uh, to say we now have almost 120 equity AFIA hospitals. This month will be a record uh, month. Uh, we'll be able to see over 100,000 uh, patients in one month, uh, suggesting that uh, the product and rating has placed as uh, number one in uh, health provider when you combine accessibility, affordability, and quality. And if on quality start alone, we are ranked number two or three, number three uh, in the country. So well, that is the offering we are, uh, we are making. And I'm glad that the MD of Equity Afia, maybe a wave, uh, is here uh, with his team um, of doctors. So that is, so the opportunity for health is much uh, bigger. So the Equity Insurance Group, uh, as we can see on the next slide, uh, the opportunity is big in whichever country you take. Uh, and uh, that data, so we have analyzed the data to map the opportunity to be able to uh, craft it. And I'm glad uh, that uh, we have our MD uh, for the insurance group in Nigeria. We have the MD of general insurance in the room, the MD of the live insurance and the health insurance. So we are not talking of what we shall do, it's what we have done. And that is why we are able to provide um, uh, this. Um. From the onset, insurance uh, has done better than we did in banking. In terms of market positioning, uh, it's a very, very good start. Uh, we have only been in operation for a very short period. Uh, we have been uh, in operation for 21 months as at December, so it's less than two years. Uh, the first um, uh, year uh, was nine months. Last year was our first uh, full year. Uh, but as you can see, as at September, uh, we had managed to, uh, to take position uh, four in profitability in group life. 7% um, of the entire market share of group life and credit, and we had managed to get 2% of live industry market share and take position 11 uh, in the ranking of uh, insurance and position uh, 5 in terms of group life. So very confident uh, that uh, this is an area uh, we we'll do very well. Uh, if uh, people have been judging uh, my enthusiasm about uh, insurance, my pronouncement about insurance, data supports my confidence that will transform insurance like we shall transform health uh, because uh, health will be part um, uh, of this. So the growth and expansion story uh, of insurance, uh, as we can see, uh, it's very well covered. Uh, we know uh, the potential with the distribution capabilities we have, the alignment we have been able to make to uh, our anchor strategy, the African Recovery and Resilient Plan. We know where the market is. We know the headroom. We know the, uh, the length of the runway. We know uh, the tools to use. And we are glad that uh, we have entered the insurance and it is profitable. And uh, if you look at uh, the product offering, um, again, uh, we are addressing the needs of the customers. Uh, uh, and we can see uh, the first um, uh, few months, uh, the number of customers we reached, unique customers, and where we are, uh, what uh, is to be insured, what product, and how the cost structure uh, how the non funded income will be affected. Uh, and I will invite you uh, to look at these details because as they say, the devil is in details. So uh, you understand uh, the preparation. So if we move to the next uh, slide and we see 
uh, performance and growth uh, and demonstrated distribution capability. Uh, look at what has just happened. Uh, insurance revenue uh, last year grew by 57%. Total revenue grew by uh, 68%. Profit before tax grew by uh, 39%. This is a startup. You're talking of a startup. And if you look at the total assets of the startup, is 20 billion shillings balance sheet. And the issue uh, we could see is last year's uh, but one numbers, 4.9 billion gave us position 11. 20 billion will put us in the top five largest insurance. Look at return of a startup. Last year, return on equity 60%. Despite the growth, uh, return moves to 70%. A return on asset of 5.4, much higher than the return that we have uh, in the bank and the group. And we have been able to manage the loss ratio. But look at uh, the startup's contribution uh, to equity profit before tax. 1.8%, almost 2% of the entire profit of the group before tax is now coming from issuers. Revenue, 1.4, total asset, 1.1. But look at total asset, 1.1, but profit before tax, um, 1.8. The amplifier, uh, because of the efficiency, uh, because of leveraging on the capabilities. Uh, so. But uh, what is uh, most encouraging is uptake of policies. So if you look at uh, uh, the performance and growth and distribution capability, we have been able to uh, issue 9.94 million policies in 21 months. So if you divide uh, that uh, by 21 months, uh, it gives you the intensity of distribution of policies per month. And we can see new policies last year were 5.5 million policies. The unique customers reached in just 21 uh, months, uh, 1.3 million customers. And we can see uh, digital distribution, 82%. People might have been asked, uh, asking themselves, why would a startup have a return of equity of 70%. It's simply because the insurance is not using brokers and uh, agents who take maybe close to 40% of the revenue. It is using um, uh, technology capabilities and it's also leveraging on bank assurance. And um, we are grateful to the MD of Kenya, Gerard, maybe you could wave, uh, for uh, uh, giving us uh, an opportunity to partner with the bank assurance and be able to demonstrate. Now, expolate this growth, George, and tell me where insurance will be by 2030. And give me just one listen, George, as a friend, why insurance will not be bigger than the bank. Ajara, you will have failed. It will not become, insurance will not be bigger than the bank. And I know failure is not part of your vocabulary. So we're very, very confident. We, as we said, we have the right people. You can have the right strategy if you don't have the right people. Uh, and uh, Ajara is really supported by a very able team. The MDs of the insurance company, the leadership of the insurance group, maybe if we could start. Uh, as you can see them, <laughs> they are very seasoned persons. Very seasoned persons. The best MDs we could get in the market, as you can see, they are all MDs uh, from uh, the best uh, insurance in the market. And that is uh, why a, a good, thank you very much, colleagues. I'm very proud of you. And that is the power of a strong brand. A startup attracts the MD of the, uh, or the MDs, not one, not two, not the three of the largest insurance companies in the country. The reputation. People uh, seem never to understand when you talk about brand value. 
And I'm really excited that uh, the blood uh, value of equity is nearly 70 billion shillings on a standalone basis. That is how you monetize blood. You say you want leaders to, st to, give, uh, uh, to start your business and you attract the best people uh, globally. I guess uh, you are South African. Eh? Botswana. Uh, Zimbabwe. Zambia. Now you, you can see. Uh, uh, Kenyan. <laughs> now you can see we are spoiled of talent. Now you can see how easy it will be if, if equity chooses to go to Southern Africa. They have already understood the culture, they like the bread, and they have chosen to come for the bread and take it home. So that is the power of bread, and we are glad that uh, we, we saw it in advance to protect the equity bread, and um, we are able to monetize it. The, that is now the second group. The third group that uh, I'm very grateful about is the technology group. And the technology group has managed to help us move from our brick and mortar infrastructure to a technology platform. And uh, this uh, group provides uh, coordinated, agile, and extensive uh, technology capabilities. And so it provides across, it is mapped against uh, the African Recovery and Resilient Plan. And I want to recognize our IT gurus led uh, uh, by Michael Coffey. Uh, Michael Coffey and your team can stand. I can't thank you enough uh, for liberating us. Uh, very good. Again, very seasoned uh, people <laughs> from Tanzania, from uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, again, Africa is in the room. If we didn't really understand equity, that's the power of our blood. So we solve the problem with the best talent you can get anywhere in, in the world. Uh, thank you, colleagues. So, uh, let's look at what uh, the technology group has done in just a very short time. By moving uh, us from branches, look at what uh, the uh, that team did. It allowed us last year to give 6.2 million loans worth 284.6 billion. Allowed it to 285 billion. You can never do that in a branch. You can't be able to have 6.2 million people walk through a door and do manual papers. And we can see, so, and when you look at um, the repayment uh, of the loans, as uh, we can see, uh, it is very high uh, return. One slide back, please. If you look at uh, the revenues, uh, growing at the same level with the repayments, with the growth in disbursement. Uh, so essentially, very efficient uh, capability very efficient system with minimal uh, uh, capability. Alvin, you didn't start uh, with the technology team. You host them in FINSA. So Alvin uh, provides them with the infrastructure and they bring the capability. So the group enablement, uh, as we can see, it's group-wide when uh, we look at the next slide. And so these loans are distributed throughout uh, the entire region. So it's a one instant system that uh, provides drones across uh, the entire uh, region. And we can see the impact that it has, the growth rates we are able to achieve in each country, whether it's a disbursement and whether it's uh, on value. And then we can see the freedom of choice we have given to the customers to choose the channel and to choose the device uh, that, uh, so the technology group enables banking business. Uh, and we have migrated to uh, fixed and variable channels. So there is still uh, a group of customers who are going to the branches, but as you can see, it's a declining. Last year, 
uh, the number of customers uh, going to or transaction done in the branches remained the same like the previous year. The number uh, uh, going to the ATMs declined by 10%. But if you look at the value, ATMs grew by 17% and branches by 14%, meaning branches are now for the high net worth transactions. They are SMEs, corporate businesses. Uh, the individual transaction, personal transactions have moved, and they either they have moved to the variable channels, agents and merchants, but again, we can see the customers are moving from merchants, they're moving away from agents, and where are they going? They are going on the self-service channels, and whether it's EasyNet, pay with equity merchants, whether it's EasyBiz, whether it's easy FX, whether it's equity mobile, whether it's equitel, that's where the customers are. That's the banking of the future. That technology stack of capabilities has transformed this group. And now uh, this group has um, first uh, mover advantage. The COVID acted as a tailwind for adoption. We struggled a little bit the last uh, previous two years because the volume of transaction grew faster than our capability. But uh, I want again uh, to praise and to acknowledge the technology group uh, for what they have done. They've been able to migrate under the leadership of Sam Kerobe, uh, uh, our technology, the new movers from legacy systems, and uh, we now are confident that uh, we have the high, best breed of uh, technology system, whether it's for processing, whether it's for storage, whether it's uh, transaction processing, whether it's the application, but more importantly, the customers have the freedom of choice. Equity group is no longer the place you go to. It's what you do on devices, wherever you, wherever you are, whatever type. We have compressed distance and we have compressed time. We are now an online banking business uh, based on our technology. So when you talk about uh, technology companies in financial services, start with equity because we are now using digital capabilities. It will take time to carry people along, but we have seen the transactions, we have seen the channels and the movement. Um, branches are now for customer acquisition. Branches are advisory centers. Branches are centers of excellence. Uh, branches are centers for selling, not for transacting. We transact online, we have become a digital business, as we can see in the next uh, two slides. Uh, and we see how the channels are moving. You have moved too fast. Uh, the merchants, the ATM, the branches at the bottom, uh, it's agency which are flattened out, uh, it's the digital channels. Look at the number of digital channel transactions in millions. 805 on digital devices. Branches, 18 million. Merchants, 19 million. So self-service capability. Equity Group is a technology platform uh, providing financial services. And the data then becomes even more cl uh, greater clarity when you look at 98% uh, of all transactions outside the branch. They're in the digital channels uh, in terms of number. So broadly, uh, this uh, speaks a lot about the capabilities that have been built uh, and uh, the build-up is complete. We now have um, a capability and when you look uh, at number, cashless transactions, uh, 2022, 82% and uh, this year, last year, 85. So if they are cashless, then we are a digital organization. 
we have digitized banking, we have digitized insurance, and access uh, is uh, in that uh, perspective. And very few uh, go over the counter, uh, the last 9% is third party, 7% uh, is uh, uh, in the branch in terms of value. So, and that then uh, gives us an opportunity to go to the fourth group. We have done banking, we have done insurance, we have done the technology, our fourth group. We are no longer in core banking. We are a very diversified investment group in banking, in insurance, in technology, and in philanthropy. And with that, let me introduce you to impact investment and sustainability, the Equity Group Foundation, which as we saw is in education and leadership, Wings to Fry, Elimu, and ELP, leadership development under ELP, enterprise development, financial and, uh, inclusion, entrepreneurship, health, energy and environment, food and agriculture. I can broadly uh, say in agri food and agriculture, you all know, we're in partnership with the government on Kirimo Biashara uh, since 2008. It's our flagship agricultural produce. This, the intervention of the foundation to capacitate small-scale farmers to move from peace and farming to agribusinesses has increased our lending to agriculture from 3% to 16% of our entire loan book. And I take pride as a Kenyan that uh, I respect and recognize why I was brought up in rural villages. If we don't fund agriculture, which is contributing 30% of our GDP, something is wrong. So we have chosen to lead the way and we promise by 2030, 30% of our entire loan book will be in agriculture so that we give um, rural communities an opportunity to be funded. We are a bank that um, is a, a listening, caring financial partners. Agriculture have failed to transform because of lack of credit. Uh, we thank the foundation for being the catalyst by capacitating the, uh, the farmers, de-risking them so that we can. We are uh, the sole partners of World Food Program, uh, IFAD, and uh, World and FAO uh, in the entire region because of our commitment to transform this uh, region. Energy and environment, uh, as you all know, we are taking pride, we are in celebration mood, and we want to invite you to celebrate with us. IFC, the private sector arm of the World Bank, named us last year as the bank that has the highest number of uh, climate financing loans for mitigation and adaptation worldwide, not in Kenya not in East Africa, not in Africa, but worldwide. And we take pride that we have chosen to provide leadership. The adoption of sustainability talks about our mindset about risk. Risk is not just within the internal environment, risk is also about the external environment. If climate has threatened our communities, we have chosen to address that by providing our communities with uh, uh, risk mitigation tools. That's why we have the highest number of loans anywhere in the world uh, dedicated to mitigation and adaptation. We also take pride that uh, we have been able to empower 450,000 households to transition from fossil wood fuel energy for cooking uh, into renewable energy. And uh, that uh, is something, uh, if nothing else, we are proud of, is that uh, we are addressing a health issues with families uh, that um, are exposed to uh, dust or smoke dust in crowded kitchens. Um, and we have extended that now to schools, and we are on our way to converting 
8,000 schools uh, that uh, operate kitchens to move away from using wood to using LPG. Again, to liberate uh, our kitchen staff in all our schools, to protect our um, school children from harmful uh, smoke and emissions uh, as our contribution to lead a, a responsible citizen. But more importantly, uh, because it's the right thing to do. So quite a lot of investment. Health, as I said, this month will be a record month when we see more than 100,000 patients uh, walking through the doors of 120 uh, equity AFIA clinics providing health. Health shows the circular nature of equity uh, group foundation. The medical doctors who are learning equity AFIA franchise started as wings to fly. We took them when, uh, in Form 1, when they were disadvantaged, uh, they had uh, financial challenges. We went through a journey of four years. They, they joined the equity leadership program, internship in the bank. Most of them, we sent them out uh, as, uh, of the country. But those who did medicine, then after graduating and practicing, we took them back and say, solve Kenya's problem of access to affordable quality health. And they are the ones who will hold the franchise of the 120 um, uh, hospitals. We are not in it for profit. The franchise is held by Equity Afia, a non-profit making subsidiary of Equity Group Foundation. So it's not for profit. This is to solve a social problem. That is the heart of equity. When people say equity has a soul and a human face, equity up here uh, speaks of what that means uh, in practical terms. Enterprise development, I think that's where we have done very, very well. We have trained, de-risked about uh, 580,000 uh, young people we have trained, we have funded 284,000. We have given them 234 billion shillings. They have started their businesses and they have created 1.3 million jobs to their fellow young people. That could never have happened if it was not for the foundation, de-risking them to, by training them, capacitating them to be able to uh, enter into the financial sector and also the foundation providing us with a guarantee, uh, risk sharing guarantee, that we are not on our own. Uh, the foundation is with us to support young people. So that is the foundation in a nutshell. If Alex, we go to the next slide. You can see the magnitude. 55,000 scholarships. Um, and I'm sorry, the number for this year has not been taken, that should be 60,000. We have crocked this uh, 60,000 this year. Uh, 887 are in global universities. As we can see, 218 are in Tibet, in, uh, are in uh, um, the top universities in the world. We can see the Tibet, we can see the transition. Any child who comes through the wings to fry, out of 82% of all of them who go to university. That's amazing. And 97% uh, of all of them will finish secondary education. We take care of our children. It's not about a scholarship. It's an integrated scholarship that provides including love and support for the child in every... We have seen the youth that we have been able to train we have seen the SMEs that uh, we have given three, uh, 275 uh, billion shillings. We have seen the farmers, uh, the 3.8 percent farmers, we have turned into agribusinesses. We can see the agribusinesses that we have turned into medium businesses. We have talked about the clean energy devices, the 25 million trees that um, we have been able to plant. The equity Afia uh, clinics are now 120, so this seems to be 
or December, there are December numbers I'm talking about today, I'm up to date. And as you can see, we have spent a total of 648 million US dollars. If you multiply that uh, by about 130, that gives you a figure of 100 billion plus that equity has devoted to doing good. We are believers that uh, doing well uh, can be done alongside doing good to society. This award, uh, because of uh, this program, we are winners of uh, the Global Vision Award because of this program. We are winners of the World Entrepreneurship Award because of this intervention. Equity has a two-aging business model. Uh, an economic aging and a social aging. Equity has redefined the philanthropy. It, it has brought in corporate philanthropy that the corporates can give. We give 2% of our revenue, uh, both in cash and in kind, to make this happen, and as a result. The market has been very kind to us. It has validated our, these are partners, you can see. And that, again, is uh, the power of a brand. Look at the people who are partnering with Equity Group Foundation. It's simply because of strong governance. We can be trusted. We are reliable. We execute. We deliver. That's the message uh, when you see this. But the market has also validated us, and we are very excited that when we look at uh, the market cap, we may not be the biggest by balance sheet, but we are the biggest in market value. The market would be willing to pay 127 billion. That was as at December, when the price was that a three shilling. As yesterday, the price was nearly 50 shillings. So it gives you where equity is. We're excited as the market starts to recover. The biggest recovery is equity bank. On US dollar terms, uh, the equity uh, share is 78% uh, up since the beginning of the year. And in Kenya shillings terms, we are 64% up. You can never lie to the market. The market tells, gives you the feedback. And we look at the market as the true mirror that uh, validates uh, what uh, our strategy is. Now, I've given a long story. And uh, I can see some people asking, James, where are the numbers? <laughs> yeah. Where are the numbers? Because um, numbers never lie. They are what they are. So let's go to the numbers. And uh, customer deposits is up 29% uh, to 1.4 trillion. Loans, 26% to 887 billion. Interest uh, margin edged up 0 0.2 to 7.4. Total income, 25% up to 180 billion. Lanking is now one of the largest uh, companies in terms of revenue on the African continent. And the number you have been waiting for, there it is, 43.7 billion shillings profit after tax. We are 5% down simply because we decided to maintain 32% of our entire loan book below at 13% while we are funding the bank deposit at 18%. It's a trade-off, money or the customer, money or the client. There are times expanding by 26% during a global macro uh, headwind environment. Let's look at the income. We have talked about it. Let's validate what we said. Look at interest income growing at 30%. Interest expense, 53%. That's what we have been shielding our consumer customers from. We took the heat. We took the bullet on their behalf. I hope this will strengthen our relationship with Kenyans. 
that when we were called upon to be there for them, we answered, we responded. If your account is not in equity, we are not providing you with an umbrella. We provide our, our customers with an umbrella when it's rainy. So I invite you uh, that that is the ethos of equity. That's what equity believes in. Uh, it's not when it means changing, uh, safeguarding lives, expanding opportunity, that's what it is. And hence our net income grew much lower, 21%, even lower than non-funded uh, income, 30%, uh, total income at 25%. But look at uh, protecting the future, ensuring uh, that um, we uh, have a break with the end of the crisis, 139% growth in provisions. And that's how we have ended up with nine, coverage of 90%. Uh, Inflation, uh, exchange rate, you can see its effect in operating expenses and salaries. Uh, total cost, 52%. We believe those things are over. And uh, like me, I'm sure you are seeing the, uh, the p and I will present to you next year. It will be very different. This is a safeguard of the Kenyans. This is a PNL which is a nabrera during a rainy season for Kenyans. Uh, we don't need to co continue when times are good. They don't need us. And that gives us profit before tax of 43.7 compared to 46 last year, uh, 5%. But remember, we have provided an umbrella to our customers. The debate was, what do we do with the shareholders? So the board, in its wisdom, resolved to give um, uh, uh, the shareholders a record dividend of 15 billion shillings. That dividend is four shillings per share. Um, and as you can see, the dividend payout is 36% of the entire 43.6 billion has been given to the shareholders. Dividend yield, 11.9%. Tell me of another company with a dividend yield of 12%. But more importantly is the dividend yield on par. The equity share that we said is paying uh, four shilling. When you paid, when you bought and paid the price, the only amount of money that came to equity as capital is five cents. The par value of the share of equity is five cents. And for five cents that you paid, you are getting four shillings per year. And as you can see, even last year, the shareholders were paid four shillings. A sustained record payment of dividend, predictability. Shareholders, like customers, can count on equity uh, group. Um, so that gives us um, the income and statement. But if again, you look at it, uh, the next slide, you see what uh, we talked about. Profit before tax, as you can see, the third and fourth quarter, they were very low. Why? Because that's when we decided to be prudent, uh, to be aggressive in provisions. The 32 billion provision came through uh, the third and fourth quarter. The aging is not impaired. There is nothing fundamental uh, change in equity. It's prudence. It's risk management. Take the heat and cross the chapter of uh, challenging, turbulent macro, and go into the future confident that you, have, uh, you can deliver in every respect. If we move on, that gives you then um, uh, subsidiaries. If you want a breakdown, investors like uh, breakdown, who did what in deposit, in loans, in total assets, in revenue, you have it there. If you want the cost uh, before provisions, uh, a subsidiary, you have it. Profit before uh, provisions, you have it. Now, this is the most interesting graph. 
if you, Alex, you go and slide back. Alex, uh, yeah, here. Fifty percent of the deposits are now in the regional subsidiaries. Kenya, as we said, is 51. You go to loans, uh, Kenya is 50, the subsidiaries are 50. Total assets, 50-50. Uh, Profits, revenue, uh, subsidiaries, 56%. Now, these are subsidiaries in the fastest growing countries in the world, Tanzania, Rwanda. I don't think I need to tell you how the future looks like. That's what the story was all about. The future of equity is not the growth rate of the GDP of Kenya. It's the GDP growth rate of East Africa. And if you look, if these countries are growing at a GDP of uh, uh, six, our profitability, our loan book is growing at 30% minimum. Our profitability, I'd like to go to the next uh, slide, is growing onwards of 40%. Six times faster than the GDP. These are frontier markets. I'm helping you to complete that template of valuation. That's really what uh, uh, this data uh, speaks to. And that then uh, brings me to return on asset. Uh, and as we have seen, um, we are giving you a picture of the two largest subsidiaries, uh, Kenya and DLC. And we can see how quickly Kenya uh, DLC is scribing up, catching up with Kenya. It's Kenya which almost hold, uh, wholly took the provisions. It's not that Kenya has been impaired. It's not that uh, the returns of Kenya will be like this next year. Kenya will challenge the subsidiaries because it decided to write off uh, its, uh, and provide for its uh, uh, NPLs. And in terms of ratios, because those are important, uh, as we all see, the most important one you may be concerned about is return on assets, uh, the NPL ratio, the coverage, uh, but more important, trade capital. Look at it. Whether it's uh, core capital or total capital, equity has a buffer of four percentage points, 400 basis points above the legal minimum. What does it mean? We can uh, release the break. We can grow. We can allow the technology platform to disburse another six, B, uh, six million loans without worrying about capital. We have well funded. What are we saying? If you look at liquidity, 53%, we talk about capital, 400 basis points buffer. Any the buffers that a business require are capital, their liquidity, and the quality of portfolio. With 90% coverage, the quality buffer is there, the capital buffer is there, the liquidity buffer is there. That is the best health check of an organization. And the business, as a doctor of business, world best entrepreneur, Ernest and Young, 2012, I can declare equity group to be in very good state of health, to grow, to expand, and to fulfill its purpose. Professor Mashari, I will not ask you about the, the health of the business. I will ask you about my health, but for business, there we are, Dr. John. This today is my day. It's about businesses. The health of the equity group couldn't be better. A business can't ask for liquidity more than 50%. What does it mean? The entire balance sheet of 1.8 trillion, 50% of it is in cash or near cash. 700, uh, 500 billion in government securities, 300 billion in cash. We already know uh, the near ones. And uh, bank accounts and the rest and the rest. So uh, the health of the bank. Because of that, then we are able to 
confidently predict the future. As you can see, loan growth and deposit growth, the momentum has been slow. We have been very prudent. We think we will grow both of them at 20%. Net interest margin will expand from 7.2 to 7.6. Non-funded uh, income will remain close to where it was 42. Uh, cost income ratio will make significant progress there. We'll move from 52 to between 48 and 50 a 10% improvement in cost income ratio on a 1.8 trillion, on a 200 billion level. It, it should tell you how uh, the, the numbers will look like uh, next year. Return on equity, we are confident to say it will be between 25 and 30. Return on asset will age between 3.2 and 3.7. Cost of risk, as we said, we took a 4.4 cost of risk this year, a provision of 32.8 billion. As you can see, uh, we are talking about half that. Um, if we, there is anything that uh, we need to be cleaned up. LPLs, we are saying we are headed to single digit and subsidiaries contribution. Uh, there will be a rivalry between uh, subsidiaries and um, Kenya. As we can see, uh, subsidiaries' contribution uh, was 50, and we are now saying asset 50 to 55. But when it comes to profits, they were 56. But you can see what we are predicting. They will be 45 to 50. Not because they will not be profitable, but because Kenya has fully provided its loans. Kenya is the one that will bounce back in a big time and uh, will edge back uh, uh, the reason. So after that is apodexis, but let me learn you through apodexis. Uh, that is global recognition. Uh, equity is a global uh, company with the, its headquarters in Nairobi. As you can see these awards, they are Moody's, they are Brad Finance, they are Banker, they are not Rocco or Region, they are global awards. That's the league that equity on. Don't go too fast, Alex. If you look at uh, one side back, if you look at um, uh, the uh, lower uh, level, again, all, all global awards, but uh, to a company with its headquarters in Africa, in Nairobi. If you go to the next uh, slide, Euro Money, sorry, Alex, oh, I'm sorry, Euro Money, African Banker, the Banker, uh, and all that uh, visa. Uh, again, these are all global awards. But when you come domestic, local, that is where we know to play. This is what you call a uh, home game. Out of the 24 awards that the banks compete for, we took number one, 18 of them. That is equity on a home match. Continue. The next slide. And uh, globally, number two, best uh, blood, banking blood in the world, position one in Africa. And as we can see, it's a triple A star and uh, a blood value of uh, 450 million US dollars or 64 billion shillings. That's the blood value. We talked about the blood a lot. A global rating, again, a Bloomberg places equity in the top 50 in the world. Uh, people call this the Nobel uh, Peace Prize on, uh, for business. Uh, we are holders. And then, uh, as we can see, global ratings continue, Alex, uh, across the board. A reputation. You tell me who you work with, I will tell you who you are, and we can see what matters to us. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, equity in a nutshell. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity you gave me. Um, we'll give you a complete deck of this investor briefing before you leave. It's printed for you, don't leave it behind. And the summary of everything I've said 
in a press release so that uh, you take the notes away with you. Um, I want to stop there. I know I've talked a lot, but uh, I was summarizing a whole year. So I've done very well to summarize a year in under one hour. So uh, I, I'm not shy uh, to have done that. But, uh, we told you what we wanted you to hear. Tell us what you wanted to hear with your questions. There is a panel here. Yes, George, go first. And if I introduce next to me is Ajela, she will answer insurance questions. Sam Kerobe will answer banking questions. Brent will answer questions on strategy. And Mary at the end will answer questions about the rules. We know you always have loans questions. George, go. And you can point on, to your on, uh, on NPLs, which sectors do you, would you finger, would you point a finger to uh, as to be the ones, uh, uh, I mean, creating a drag? Because even though equity is uh, doing well compared to the industry, but uh, of course, it is not doing very well compared to itself. Uh, are there specific sectors which uh, are not doing very well uh, with their loans? And if so, why? Or is it just a, a macroeconomic issue? When is uh, Equity Afia relaunching, as you promised us last time? And uh, in terms of uh, professional accountability at strategic and uh, operational level, um, uh, are uh, Kenyans becoming an uh, endangered species around here? Very, very good, Dr. Tang in cheek. You can see it there. You take question uh, two about equity uh, Afia. Go ahead and see it uh, in front. Number question one is yours, Mary. Brent, I think uh, the third question is yours. Eh? Mary, do you want to go first? Sure, and thank you for the question. Um, the sectors I'd highlight that I've been a drug, and this is throughout the year, would be real estate, manufacturing, transport and logistics, and government-linked construction companies. So that specifically for equity group contributed to maybe 70% of the deterioration that you see year on year. So those would be the sectors that I'll highlight. So once the government pays, and the government eventually pays, so the pro we will release the provisions that we have made uh, on those loans. Uh, the second question, Dr. John. Okay, so thank you. The, the question was on the relaunch, I think the continued expansion of Equity Afia. I think we'd given a, a commitment that we're going to do a full launch once we are in all the counties of the country and once we feel uh, satisfied with the Equity Afia's uh, expansion. I think we're excited to say that at the close of the year, we had uh, established presence in all the counties of the country. And the target this year is to further that expansion into the sub-counties of the country. So I think it would then be a good time to organize for that launch when um, our customers in the market can see presence of equity if you're very close to their proximity. So thank you. Uh, George, uh, we don't want to launch when your auntie uh, can't have uh, an equity up here in uh, the sub-county. We don't want her to go to Kakamega or Bugoma. We want equity up here. So we're at 120. We hope by the end of this year we'll be at 300. Uh, the second thing we are waiting for is uh, equity health insurance to, so that it launches um, insurance to make health affordable. So it and make it almost universal for everybody. So instead of you either paying out of the pocket for your parents' health, then you just take a policy for them, and uh, hopefully um, they will just be going to the sub-county. The sub-county will be a hub, uh, maybe closer to your auntie's home, there will be a satellite, and uh, to the location of set, uh, center uh, spoke. So there will be a community nurse almost close to the village, uh, who they can be uh, providing help to your pal parents without them having to travel, and you don't have to worry so much because a medical uh, skilled person or like a medical staff is available 
particularly parents who have um, chronic ailments, uh, diabetics, high blood pressure, uh, screening them constantly and taking their vitals so that uh, truly uh, the doctor had had. So it's really a distributed community health. Remember, it's not about profit. It's purely sustainability. Brent, do you want to go for the third question? So just in terms of the observations you've made of the, of the names that were mentioned, so I would just like to highlight that Equity Group is an East African bank. You'll notice from the results that more than 50% of assets, revenue, and profit is generated outside of Kenya. The way the group has positioned itself is as a platform to what is essentially the highest growing region, one of the highest growing regions in the world. So the reflection of the capacity and the skill set is not reflective of the geographies that we operate in, but is more reflective of the ambition we have. You'll notice to your observation that six of the people standing in front of you, one is not Kenyan. So the new businesses we have are businesses that are, including the banking, you'll, you'll recall and observe from the presentation that we have four verticals. There's the bank, there's the insurance, there's the technology, and there is the foundation. And these operate across and will operate across six geographies. So again, the reflection of the capacity and skill set is reflective of our ambition. Thank you. Uh, and George, maybe if I extend that a little bit, um, as you can see, equity is an equal opportunity uh, organization. When you look at uh, our customer base, 54% of our customers are women. If you look at uh, the people uh, answering questions together with myself, we are six. Six are ladies and six are men. It's an equal opportunity organization. When you talk about sustainability, equity leaves what it says. Integrity is doing what uh, you say. Another question? Very good. Uh, there and then, uh, yeah, uh, very good. Okay. And we'll take three questions, so keep on writing. Um, good morning. Mike. That mic is off. Thank you. Yeah, I am now. Yeah, Zao Jones can start. Now let him, let her, let's give, be patient with her. Please go. Good morning. My name is Purity from Abojani, and I have a question for... Is Andrew. that mic working truly? Let's go there until the mic works. Please. Thank you, Dr. Ari. I want to start by thanking Dr. Rimwangi and uh, Professor Macharia heading the, uh, the board for a well done job because you have been ranked number two in Africa and many other activities we oh, are number showing. One number Africa, one in number Africa, two in the world. Um, number two in the world, and other various capacities we are adding on. Mr. Mwangi, I would want to say we as shareholders, we are very thankful for the declaration of the, for a very high dividend today because we have never enjoyed that. We are going to enjoy a very high dividend. We also want to thank you for the effort you have shown to improve the two regional branches, the DRC and, 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 and Rwanda, for a very quick time, very, very shortest time that has become banks, regional banks, which we can count on. The other time when we were in this room, Mr. Mwangi proposed efforts and conser careful conservation has to be extended to Ethiopia to see whether we can come up with a regional bank to boost our business further and further. Because the area has potential because of the popul population. And uh, I would wish, I know it takes time to come up with a regional decision, but I would want to, to emphasize to you to keep on uh, studying and see whether we can come up with something. Finally, finally, I would want to say there is a question mark in DRC on receiving money. Counting money has been a bit slow to our bank. Are we doing something to improve the receiving money in DRC? Because money for the DRC is a huge bark in the unpredictable and uh, the counting takes a day before you know what a customer brought. Can we be improved further? Thank you. 
Uh, thank you. Teroba, you take the banking question. Uh, Brent, you take uh, the regional question. And uh, Gertrude, prepare then uh, to share your experience of uh, acquisition of uh, Koja Bank in Rwanda. Yes. The next one. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so my name is Piriti from Abodzani. I have a question for Angela in, uh, in the, about insurance. So um, I know I understand that the bank is very uh, optimistic in terms of disrupting the insurance industry, like you have disrupted the banking industry. But uh, we are seeing a challenge uh, of uh, penetration. And at the same time, we have uh, around five insurance uh, companies that are still yet to solve this very challenge. So my question is, other than technology, what, what other strategies are in place to make sure that we actually improve the insurance penetration in the country? Thank you. That's to Ajara, back there. And pass the mic here, down here. Thank you, CEO. My name is Sally Chepkorir, and I am a shareholder. Uh, CEO, uh, we are cognizant and alive to the fact that uh, incredible leadership is the bedrock of every success in any given company or institution. I want to laud you for producing incredible results despite the most difficult year, year 2023. We are very proud of you, uh, plus Professor, plus the whole team, and we know that we are far, we are going far, we, are, we came from far. We are far and we are headed far. Now on to my question. My question is on AI. And Mr. Kirubi will answer this. <laughs> AI is to stay. A A AI is here to stay. Do you plan to incorporate fully in your company? And if so, is it a threat or an opportunity? Or is it an enabler or a distractor to human resource? And what plans do you have in the company so that you can educate us as, as consumers or, or uh, customers so that we can make informed decisions? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, a powerful question. Uh, Professor Masharia, shareholders would like to hear your voice, looks right? So we'll give you 10 minutes at the end. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Um, good morning and congratulations for the wonderful results. I want to ask whether there are any specific challenges or risks that the company anticipates in the near future and how you plan to mitigate them. Thank you. Very good. Sam Kitwekere, that is your question. Uh, risks uh, that you are managing. Um, and I think uh, Beth, uh, from oversight on behalf of the board, uh, what does uh, the group uh, chief auditors see? Yeah. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Diljot Kordinsa. I'm from CIC Asset Management and a youth representation to UNEP. Uh, firstly, I'd like to congratulate you for the outstanding performing, uh, performing results. So my question is more focused on uh, sustainability and the ESG. Um, given the long-standing partnership between Equity Bank and the United Nations since 2021, how has the collaboration evolved over the past three years in terms of driving sustainable development goals and promoting ESG principles within the group's operation and across its ecosystem? And could you kindly provide an overview of the specific ESG-focused projects and initiatives undertaken by Equity Bank since the inception of the Strategic Alliance and highlight any notable achievements of or milestones in advancing sustainable objectives. Thank you. Very good. Leshma, are you in the room? Leshma? Joy? Is Joy in the room? Uh, somebody call them. Let them come and answer that question. So let's first of all answer the questions that have been asked. Who wants to go first? Okay, Kerobe, go AI. Uh, th 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 thank you, uh, our investors and shareholders and colleagues. The, the question about AI, and thank you for raising that, is very timely 
And let me start by saying that we've embedded AI in a lot of our processes uh, currently. And you did ask whether we plan to incorporate that fully. That's already what we are doing. In the bigger scope, when uh, what was explained about the groups that we are having, banking group, the insurance group, the foundation group, we are using what's called the enterprise architecture to embed data and improve decision making through AI. Is it a threat to the customers? It makes it easier. AI will be able to offer you more solutions as you spend on lifestyle. Just to give an example, if you are buying a car, you'll be able to be offered an insurance product embedded in the same product. And the bank will be able to lead you in case you need to buy financed uh, to purchase a premium uh, for your motor. If you are borrowing in agriculture, AI will be able to know what are you borrowing for, do you need training, which crops are you planting. So for the customers, it will make it very easier. In the architecture that we are doing, we've ensured data security, that you are safe uh, in all your data is embedded and within the practice of the regulatory. So all that has been factored uh, through. Internally, we're already using AI uh, to manage the processes, uh, reconciliations uh, for the whole group, all those have been made easier. And that's why we are synergizing a lot of efficiencies by using AI. So it becomes a part of day-to-day -day life. Are there risks associated to that? Yes. And the risks come in each, every day. Uh, and Sam Gitwekere will talk about risks associated with AI. So it's something we can't live without, but to keep our eyes open uh, on that. Speaking about DRC and the cash economy, yes, DRC is a cash economy, but moving quite fast towards uh, digitizing uh, that. The areas we can improve, I hear what you said about receiving cash in the branches, speed of counting that cash, that's an area that can be improved. But just to mention, <coughs> we've rolled out agency banking in DRC, so our customers are able to use agency banking to do that. But beyond that also, we're also digitizing. All customers that we acquire are digitized. DRC would be a bit little behind in digitization if you compare to Kenya, but it's a plan that we plan to quickly move into that space. As we acquire customers, over the two million customers we have, they're using the current and most digital tools in transacting. On cross-border trade, the systems have also been made available. As you trade across the markets that we are in, you can move money across to Kenya, to Uganda, of course within their regulatory requirements on giving proof of evidence on invoicing, ETC. But the platforms are ready for that. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Brent, about uh, region. So maybe just on the region, and, and let me step back a bit here. So James mentioned that the, the global headwinds are abating, and that's very important for this region. What it implies is that there is increased positive investor sentiment and risk appetite for markets like East Africa. That's important because of the flows that we expect over the medium term. So James mentioned that this region is one of the highest growing regions in the world, and it has a high concentration of countries neighboring each other, generating north of 5% all the way to almost 7% if you look at Ethiopia. So Equity Group has seen this opportunity and it has made decisions in the past in terms of allocation of resources and capital to this geographic uh, growth area of East Africa. The acquisitions that we've been doing, the allocation of capital, what it speaks to in, in, in terms of this region, it speaks to future growth, future returns, and for the shareholders, ultimately, future dividends that we've been investing in in the past and, and even uh, today and we expect in, in the future as well. What is also important to highlight about this region in addition to the high growth that each of these countries provide is the integrated nature of this region. It's one of the most integrated regions in Africa if you just look at intra-member trade between the EAC members. Also, you'll notice that the EAC is growing in membership. 
this integrated nature highlights the natural position a regional bank like Equity Group will have and the relevance of regional banks. The, you'll notice in the results that more than 50% of balance sheet and PNL is now outside of, of Kenya. And we've taken you through our positions in each of these markets. We are at least in the top five in all of them, mostly in number two. Uh, and as James mentioned, we, we've turned around Tanzania and we're looking to grow that business now. So I'd also like to highlight that when you think of Equity Group, don't just think of Equity Group as an East African bank, but as an East African integrated financial services group. So I would like to expand your question to what are we doing as an East African integrated financial services group? You've seen what we've done with the banking business, how we've grown that organically as well as inorganically to position ourselves to be systemic. You've noticed the four verticals in the group. There is the bank, there is the insurance, there is the technology, and importantly is the, the foundation that ultimately looks to, and it somewhat ties into the question that you had from CIC on ESG. When you look at the four verticals, the bank, insurance, and the technology is essentially the economic engine that James talked about. The fourth vertical of the foundation is essentially where a lot of the activities happen in terms of what we're doing around sustainability, around social. That environmental and social pillar that the foundation provides acts as a catalyst, acts as a de-risking capability to drive the three verticals in our economic engine. So James talked about the circular outcome that has taken place with this social engine of ours. So for us, what we do in the foundation is not CSR, and it's to your point around the sustainable development goals. We believe we're having a real impact and, and it's visible in the numbers in terms of what we're doing around environmental and social. If I stand back and look at the biggest strategic intent of Equity Group, and that strategic picture is essentially what we're doing around the Africa Recovery and Resilience Plan. Our strategy is not your typical corporate strategy. Our strategy is a social and economic transformation plan for Africa. It ultimately looks to take this economic engine of ours, but importantly take this social engine to have real economic impact, but importantly, social impact. You've seen the numbers that we've provided in terms of the number of kids we've sent, uh, the health uh, initiatives that we are doing, what we're doing around social payments. These are all part of the ecosystem that we are looking to essentially penetrate and that we see as customer numbers in this region of East Africa. So for us, I'd like you to leave you with a couple of things. One is that, and it goes to the question of the resources and the capacity and skills required to have social and economic transformation. We are blind to who the individual is, but are more wary of the capabilities and their mindset. So the first, point I would like to leave you with is Equity Group is an integrated financial services group. Secondly, it is indeed a East African group, not a Kenyan group. It is an East African financial services group. It has a twin engine business model, a model that we believe will have real transformative impact in the value chains that we are looking to integrate. You'll appreciate that the value chains that 
are very fragmented. Our social engine allows us to capacitate, catalyze, transition, for instance, smallholder farmers to become agro-businesses, which in turn, our economic engine of banking, insurance, technology, provides the financial means, the convenience to essentially participate in economic activities, to participate in a more integrated value chain. So when we talk about ecosystem banking, you can get a sense of how our twin engine business model is applied. You can get a sense how this East African platform of banking, insurance, technology, and foundation will ultimately catalyze, de-risk, and capture the growth opportunities in what is probably the highest growing region in the world. So hopefully that answers. Thank you very much, uh, Brent. Let's uh, jump to Gertrude. Uh, your take on that question, given uh, your leadership position in the acquisition and merger of Koja Bank. Thank you, James. Uh, I think the recurrent theme this morning Bring is... Bring the mic closer. Uh, thank you, James. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think the recurrent theme this morning is the unique position of East Africa um, as a growth region and the opportunities that come with that. Um, last year, the shareholders gave us the mandate to acquire Koja Bank in Rwanda. We completed that acquisition in November and moved forward to merging the two banks, our bank in Rwanda at the time, Equity Bank Rwanda and Koja Bank, and brought together an integrated business of just about 128 billion Kenya shillings. I think for us, the integration is not for the sake of being big, but uh, the systemic position puts us well uh, positioned to expand uh, our offering to the people of Rwanda. Uh, as Brent has emphasized, James emphasized as well, we are an integrated financial services provider, but we are providing interconnectedness across the region as well. And so we look at our Koja Bank transaction and the merger of the two banks as a unique opportunity for us to strengthen our position in Rwanda but overall strengthen our position in the East and Central African uh, region with that connection. We will obviously in the months and, and years ahead continue to consolidate that so that uh, whatever opportunity that we thought existed is actually uh, obtained and we see the transformation that we're looking to get um, extended to the people of Rwanda. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you very much. It looks like we had down to Ajara, the insurance question. Thank you, James, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Purity, for that question. I think uh, we've been talking about our strategic intent, but I'll keep it brief. Uh, James started by saying that one of the things we wanted to focus on was winning the trust of consumers. Largely, when we engaged our members, they indicated that one of the reasons that they prefer to use social insurance, the WhatsApp groups, uh, families, ETC, is because there was a lack of trust with formal insurance uh, organizations and policies. So one of the biggest things which we feel will give us a strategic advantage to contribute to the efforts of the industry is number one, bringing to the table a brand such as Equity, which is trusted. I think we all agree that Equity is known to be member-focused, member-centric. Equity has been known to provide solutions that are relevant to customers. And so already looking at our DNA as equity, we know that we can present a brand that will focus more on what customers need as opposed to um, a, a, a supply-driven solution. The second thing we've worked a lot to do is focus on what are the barriers. One of the things that has come through is that a lot of the solutions are not demand-driven, they are supply-driven. And by nature, it means that insurance policies, when you look at the benefits, they are not tailored to provide value to the customer. When you look at the terms and conditions, they are not favorable to the customer. And so what we've decided to do is intentionally only provide demand-driven insurance where the solutions are tailored to fit the customer's needs, but also at the same time, and in a very simple way, be honest and disclose to customers what the terms and conditions of the policies are 
upfront so that they understand the rules of engagement and they can also have an opportunity to buy back some of the exclusions from insurance policies. So for instance, we have some policies where we are willing to cover certain exclusions if the customers go for additional medical testing, allowing us an opportunity to profile their risk a little bit better. So we're planning to go further uh, and increase the level of risk uh, underwriting we're doing in partnership with the customer so that we have more holistic insurance solutions. I think I'll also talk about the interconnectedness of life, particularly and health. What you'll see in the market is a level of silo provision of products. For instance, a customer who has adopted a very healthy lifestyle, uh, undergoes wellness and medical testing, is less likely to present as a risk on a life insurance policy. But because products are not priced for a single customer view, they are priced at a policy level. There's no benefit from a customer. So what we plan to do is look at a customer holistically so that when they adopt, for instance, health-seeking practices, we can then extend preferential rates to them on life covers. So looking at holistic or a single customer view when we're looking at our solutions. Lastly, um, in our view, we believe that customers want lifestyle-driven insurance, and they want to consume insurance as part of their day-to-day -day activities uh, as they are driving, uh, pay for it mile per mile, uh, kilometer by kilometer, or load for load. So for us, insurance is going to be lifestyle-based as opposed to policy, and at the same time, through the partnership with the bank, we will also extend affordability. Where customers are not able to pay annually in advance, we are, through partnership with the bank, able to provide insurance premium financing so that we can then make affordability one of the, one of the benefits that we bring into the insurance conversation. But as I said, Purity, I can be here for a long time. Please allow me to stop there and happy to share with you a little bit more at a later time around what we are planning to do on insurance. Uh, just before we go to the question of uh, risk, let me make two comments or three. I think the first one is on insurance, and uh, uh, it's a very pertinent question. I remember the story of equity in the early 90s. What we did was to ask ourselves, only 4% of Kenyans have bank account. Where do the other 96 bank? And when we went to the Kenyans, uh, through focused group discussions, they gave us uh, eight barriers that made it impossible for them to be banked. You can remember the first one they said was banks open at nine and uh, close at noon. Moving from the villages to the district headquarters, you will not be there by nine, and if you leave after afternoon, you will not be able to get back home. So they, they were saying, banking uh, uh, branches don't operate hours that are suitable for rural communities. The second one uh, they talked about loudly was minimum balance. They said 10,000 is too big or is too high a balance as a minimum balance for somebody whose uh, income then, the GDP per capita, was only $240. He said, how can you have a GDP per capita of 240 and tell me to keep 10,000? And it was not just keep 10,000, that's the minimum to be able to open. That was beyond the threshold of uh, people. Then they talked, uh, they were uncomfortable with an animal called ledger fee that kept on going to their accounts and uh, taking 300 shillings every month, which they didn't understand what service they had. And they moved on. Equity was a creation of removing those barriers. Insurance, only 1.3% uh, are insured. We have gone around and asked what are the barriers. And that is why in just 21 months, we have been able to sell 9.3 million policies. 5.5 uh, million policies just in one single 12 months uh, last year. So you, you can see uh, it's, it appears it's the same trend. Why? Because we are removing barriers to access of insurance. But the biggest uh, barrier is trust. Insurances are not trusted. So that is why we have avoided the traditional distribution channels and are distributing 
using a trusted channel, a bank assurance, and online. It's the broad equity which we are monetizing. And that is why before we could uh, go into all these foundation, insurance, technology group, we uh, first of all developed a unified brand, the one equity, so that uh, we capitalize uh, on uh, the brand equity. And that's what uh, is bringing the results that we want. I think uh, on the question of um, AI, um, it is true, um, and particularly you take it from generative AI, artificial intelligence, you will realize that uh, analytic skills are very significant. That are challenge. There is a challenge of skills. There is also a challenge of inability to use. There is also a challenge of uh, misuse. Like we have cyber crime, we have uh, uh, ethical hacking, uh, all those that kind. AI also pro uh, uh, gives as many challenges. Uh, however, we have chosen to see the opportunity of using AI. And so of the six companies under the technology company, one of the companies is data enterprise. Uh, nobody can uh, beat equity in terms of data generation because of our payment capabilities. If you look at a million plus, 1.1 million pay with equity merchants, if you look at equity's 100,000 agents and the data they generate in transactions, if you look at the 12 million transactions per day that we process, the data we are accumulating is significant. When we look at that data uh, with the lens of big data and distill it, we believe a lot of insights will come from there. If you look at the moment, 98% of the transactions are happening out. That is also true of loans. Uh, loans are being uh, granted online. Insurance is being um, acquired online. It's simply because we have significant information about the customers. We can uh, credit score them. We can price their risk. We can uh, uh, f verify a lot using the data we already have, and that is all because of AI. Uh, so we see that as the growth opportunity. We see as an online business will be driven by AI, but we are also cognizant that we became, like we became cognizant of cyber crime and invested heavily. So we we'll manage the risk that. Uh, I'll go with that. In terms of uh, the question of region, just the only thing I could answer is that if you look at uh, equity approach, we said um, the East African region has a thriving ecosystem of trade interconnectedness uh, driven by strong regional integration and robust infrastructure. If you look at DLC, DLC cannot fully covered without thinking about Sabia because of interconnectedness. You can't think uh, fully about uh, supporting DLC without thinking Agora. You can't think uh, DLC without Mozambique. And I don't believe you can think about Ethiopia if it has chosen Lamu to be its gateway to the sea uh, without integrating then that corridor. So essentially, there are op huge opportunities for us to pursue using that um, um, metrics of looking at the trade routes, the interconnectedness uh, in the country, and how trade has organized itself as a facilitator. So we'll focus on the trade routes and the countries that are attractive in the trade routes. The way we started with Uganda, because the bulk of trade between the two countries is uh, exporting to each other, then uh, we'll in increase increasingly look at those countries. But as you can see, we're talking about East and Central and Southern Africa. That is more of the region, but again, we are informed by policy, we're informed by the opportunity and the ease of doing business uh, in, the, uh, in those countries. So uh, that broadly is the only thing I want to add and then push it uh, to the question of risk and the Paul and uh, Beth.
you will add a little bit. Uh, thank you. So, in our strategy and business model, uh, operating model, we've identified 16 principal risk types uh, that break down into two categories, financial and non-financial. Uh, currently, the financial risks that we pay great attention to include credit, uh, which we have discussed today, uh, include liquidity risk, uh, market risk, uh, and um, uh, we've talked about the buffers that we hold against each of those along with the capital buffers. So those four uh, we pay great attention to at the present moment. Uh, on the non-financial risk side, uh, we have nine principal risks that we manage. Uh, those that we are paying great attention to currently include uh, financial crime risk. We are all familiar uh, with the fact that uh, early this year the country was grey listed uh, by the Financial Action Task Force. So prior to that, in fact, over the last two, two and a half years, we built our capability quite significantly to manage financial crime risks, uh, both people, uh, processes, and we continue to invest in systems uh, to give us uh, that capability. Um, we have also strengthened our governance at the management level. Uh, we've uh, introduced financial crime risk committees in all subsidiaries over and above the uh, board committees responsible for this area and the non-financial risk committee at the management level. We also are paying a lot of attention to technology, information, and cybersecurity risk. <coughs> so technology is concerned with ensuring our systems are up and running, uh, available to customers at all times. And uh, you've heard um, that in that space we've done well in fact, as we speak, our app rating at the moment is 4.6 out of 5, uh, tends to hover to about uh, 4.8 out of 5, so very good app rating. We are responsible for ensuring customers can transact securely on the app and securely in all our other systems and uh, uh, branches, agencies, and all of that. Uh, so technology information and cybersecurity is really important. Uh, we had cyber incidents uh, last year affecting the country. Happy to say that uh, by virtue of the work that we as equity have done and the team capabilities we've assembled, uh, we managed to ensure that our channels, uh, digital channels and our back office operations uh, operated normally. We pay uh, attention to fraud risk, again, ensuring that customers are able to uh, uh, save with us and transact securely and our own operations are free of fraud. Happy to say that uh, digital fraud, uh, this time last year, I was reminding our shareholders and customers of our universal number, 763 000. If you get a call, uh, somebody says they are calling from equity customer service, that is the only number that you should respond to, 763 triple zero triple zero any other number is a fraudster uh, that should be reported to the bank and to the authorities uh, for action um, we pay attention to model risks and uh, within equity the ceo has mentioned spoken to our use of uh, data we use the data to develop models to inform our decisions those models carry risk by virtue of the assumptions um, that go into building the model the data and the quality of data and certain limitations and also the fact that uh, the environment can change. Uh, we saw how COVID came upon us very suddenly and unexpectedly. That uh, would upset, uh, upset the functioning of any model. So in the risk function, we have developed capabilities, we have frameworks, we have expanded uh, teams to ensure that we validate the models that we use both those that we develop as well as those that come from partners, uh, outside entities uh, that work with us. 
it's the same approach that we would take for um, AI models. And we recognize AI, as the CEO has said, both as an opportunity and also as a threat because there are bad actors determined to make use of AI uh, for criminal and other purposes, uh, deep fakes uh, and other um, uh, tools that are developing for AI. But we see the great opportunity for use of AI uh, and machine learning, so in areas such as predictive uh, uh, capabilities that we use to assess our credit portfolio uh, to see um, uh, who's likely to go into default or into difficulties before they actually go past due even one day. Uh, for fraud, uh, to scan customer transactions, uh, to pick out unusual trends in the customer transactions, but also financial crime risk monitoring. So we pay a lot of attention uh, to that. I will also touch uh, briefly on ESG and climate risk. Uh, as a country and as a region, we're exposed to uh, the effects of uh, climate risk, uh, droughts, uh, floods, uh, and other effects, plus also uh, greenhouse gas um, emissions. A number of our customers are involved in activities that contribute to uh, those emissions. So we take that uh, very seriously as a group and we try to manage that very actively, uh, also in compliance of uh, central bank regulations. So that's just picking on a few of the um, uh, 16 principal risk types and uh, giving um, priority to those that we are managing actively at the moment. Uh, but there are others that uh, we also look at. Finally, we reviewed the uh, enterprise risk framework periodically uh, to see whether there is need to make changes to those risk types, to bring in new ones and to um, uh, uh, reduce or de-escalate uh, some of the existing ones. Uh, so that's an ongoing uh, activity that we undertake. Thank you. Uh, thank, you uh, thank you very much, uh, Sam. That question has been answered by the second line of defense. What they do is oversight. The first line of defense uh, is headed by uh, Paul Wafura. And I'm really glad uh, that uh, Paul uh, chose to join us. Um, he leads the compliance level. Uh, Sam Kitwekere deals with the policy and oversight that the policy are complied with. The person who leads and keeps risk registers in the entire group, it's Paul Wafura. Each of us have been given a register. We assess how we are managing our risk, the risk that are assigned to us. And that is what has uh, created the control environment. And then his responsibility is to ensure that control environment. So uh, Wafura joined us uh, recently. Uh, he was a global leader based uh, in uh, Dubai, covering Asia, uh, Middle East, and Africa uh, for one of the largest global banks uh, in charge of compliance, and is now our group uh, uh, compliance uh, leader. Paul. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, James. Uh, your take on uh, building the capability. Yeah, so just to explain. so. My, my belief is we are strong as our weakest link. And so like Dr. James has said, in order for us to protect the bank, we need to identify what are the risks that could go wrong. And so what we focused on is having the process owners tell us from their processes what are the things that could fail. And then once we've identified those things that fail, we've put in place controls and we then monitor those controls. What we want to be is more anticipatory. We want to know what could fail, a bit like on a flight before you take off. You identify what are the things that could fail on the flight, and those are the things that get checked before the flight takes off. So our focus is implementing the enterprise risk management framework. And what that means is, um, based on the processes, the process owners know um, what could fail in their processes, and then based on the risk types that Sam has talked about, we then make sure we apply the standards that those policies for those respective risk types are adhered to. And then, of course, based on the assessment, we prioritize those are high and very high fast. And then with the mitigants, the controls we have in place, we actively monitor them. 
So the aim is for us to be able to find out what could go wrong before it happens. And once we do this, we're then better at knowing what could fail us before it happens. And so that's, that's what we're doing. We've been able to identify the entire universe of activities that get done across the different groups of the bank. And once we can do that effectively, we'll be able to predict or know what will fail us before it harms and we'll be able to um, address it in advance. So yeah, that's pretty much what we do as a first line. So essentially, um, how equity manages itself is say, let's imagine the universe of our risk and we map all of them. And we ask ourselves, is these are the risk, where can they play? Then uh, we create uh, processes and procedures to mitigate the areas they can play. Then those procedures and policies create the risk register. And whoever is touching those uh, operating in that area then gets the register and to manage the risk, assess yourself, but will be overseeing how you are. That's the first line of business. And so risk management is a catcher within the bank. So what uh, we have done is, um, as you know, our, uh, we adopt a twin strategy, offensive, growing the market, and defensive. Uh, and defensive is risk uh, management. So what we have done as a group is to intensify, strengthen our risk uh, management governance framework and uh, focus on value-based organization of culture that emphasizes on human interactions, attitudes and behavior, norms and practices that uh, drive um, a customer-centric uh, uh, innovative approach while at the same time uh, developing a strong, prudent risk management uh, culture. So it's purely inbuilt in staff, and uh, for that reason, I will give maybe uh, uh, Segawa an opportunity to uh, uh, say a few things about how we have used people uh, to manage risk, how the recruitment policy is different by attitude, norms, and and the rest. Uh, but uh, as you synthesize, uh, is there anything you wanted to add, uh, Emmanuel, from credit? Because the greatest, there are two areas of great exposure, credit and operations, cash management. And uh, some talk quite a lot about cash, uh, just two minutes about credit risk. Uh, shareholder, my, my colleagues, uh, I'll just make it uh, snappy. Uh, in terms of um, credit risks, uh, we are in a turbulent environment now, challenging environment as a result of uh, interest rates increases, um, depreciation of uh, currencies within our environment. So what do we do, basically? we need to go back to basics. When you're in a turbulent environment, you go back to basic. And that will require that you do proactive and prudent credit risk management through early alert mechanisms, getting very close to your clients and to ensure you follow the money. Secondly, in such an environment also, you need to embark on very aggressive recovery strategies focusing on short-term lending and uh, maybe selectively only doing what we call medium-term to long-term lending. But most importantly, the resources of any, or the most important resource of any organization is basically the quality of the people. So what we have done in equity is to really resource all our credit units within our subsidiaries with the right skill sets to be able to on board quality exposures. Because in such uh, the, the type of environment we are in now, if you don't have people with such skills, you may be really, really booking very bad exposures. Thanks. Wafura is from Uganda. Uh, Mark uh, is from Ghana. Back to Uganda. Sagawa, people as, uh, and the organization culture uh, that uh, breeds uh, prudence uh, and uh, 
risk management uh, behavior. Thank you, James. From a human capital perspective, there are two things which we've been very keen about to accompany the risk and compliance culture in the organization. First of all, we've invested a lot of uh, money and time in reskilling, upskilling, and multi-skilling our employees to really make sure that they fully understand how they own uh, risk management from the outset. And the risk register, as we had talked about, is really part of the immersion all employees are taken through to really understand that they actually are supposed to be part of the solutioning around risk management. But very importantly, we have also embedded risk and compliance into the key performance indicators for every employee. We deploy a tool we call the balance score card. In the balance score card, there are four quadrants. Financial key performance indicators, customer uh, performance indicators, uh, people and leadership development as a, a, a critical aspect, but very important risk and compliance um, is, is a very critical one. And so every employee is expected to have a key performance indicator on how they will proactively mitigate risk, but equally, if there's any risk identified, how they remediate and resolve and fill uh, or bridge any gaps that could be identified. So that, to a great extent, is how we've been able to embed a culture of risk and compliance. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you very much. So the last uh, line of defense is oversight by the board and the group chief internal auditor. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, formerly uh, KPMG partner, then went to Central Bank, advisor to the governor of Central Bank of Kenya, eventually chief internal auditor of the Central Bank, and we are pleased to have her as uh, our chief internal. Beth, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mwangi, and good morning, um, shareholders and colleagues, um, and our chairman. Um, my work is to help the board sleep better at night, um, I think, simply put. Um, and for me, the importance um, of our role as um, internal audit is to be able to assure, advise, and anticipate what emerging risks are coming um, in the environment. Now, how do we do that? So. One of the things we do is we continuously audit and we continuously monitor our controls um, to make sure that uh, the management and the board have a true real-time state of the control environment. Um, secondly, we want to be and we are a catalyst for change. So all the strategic initiatives that are being done by the group in all the geographies that we uh, with, that we are in, we support and we advise and provide assurance for those strategic initiatives. So that means that as the business is focused on going to market um, in whatever space we are in, whether it's in insurance, banking, technology, or even at um, the foundation, we work with management um, to provide them real-time assurance. Um, I cannot emphasize the importance of being a technology-driven function. And so for us, data analytics, AI that was spoken about today, are very key. So what you'll find is we are augmenting our team to make sure that we have relevant people, people who have, are upskilled, we are reskilling, upskilling, in the various spaces, the emerging uh, risk spaces, when, whether you look at it from a cybersecurity perspective, you look at it from ESG, cloud assurance, AI, um, in all those spaces we need to play as internal audit. Um, I think lastly for me and most important for me is to ensure that the business, the group is future-proofed, to ensure that we take advantage of the opportunities that have been spoken about today it is no small fit, and so we need to make sure that the group um, is well, is ready to take on those opportunities, uh, manage our risks effectively, and anticipate the risks that will be coming our way as we grow. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Beth. And broader, um, I've been really impressed. 
Uh, Beth has come in and introduced uh, uh, robotic or, or, uh, auditing. All transactions are audited by robots. It's no longer, so it's a risk-based uh, audit, but she doesn't go doing the ticking of boxes on transactions. That is automatically done for her. So it's purely risk-based, and she says, why don't I advise before you take the risk? And why don't I monitor as you do the risk? So we have moved audit from post-mortem to prevention. And um, watch the space. Uh, I've been very, very impressed uh, how audit has evolved uh, to, uh, in terms of uh, thinking and how you could use AI uh, to really uh, monitor and audit the bank. Um, uh, we had an audit department of 80. Uh, she came and said, maybe James, I don't need 80. I just need a maximum of 15, but with the different skills. That is where the level of equity. So it is not that the market is a low risk. Risk is where the industry is, 17% NPLs, but because we proactively manage risk, that's why we are at 11. So uh, even in credit, that's why I asked uh, the credit. Thank you very much, um, Beth. There was a question that was asked. Uh, I've seen Leshma, Joy has come in. The Eric Naivasha, you are in that question. Saladin, you are in that question. Dr. Joan, you are in that question. I will ask uh, the person who had asked the question on uh, uh, UN collaboration. They are all in now. So if you could kindly repeat, uh, it would be, uh, be very kind of you. So Joy, Leshma, Eric Naivasha, Saladin, and Dr. Joan. The question is yours. They are ready. Uh, thank you for the flow once again. Uh, my question was based most on sustainability and ESG. So um, there was the given long-standing partnership between Equity Bank and the United Nations since 2021. So my question was, how has the collaboration evolved over the past three years in terms of driving sustainable development goals and promoting ESG principles within the group's operations and across its ecosystem? And can you kindly provide an overview of the specific ESG-focused projects and initiatives undertaken by Equity Bank Group since the inception of the Strategic Alliance and highlight any notable achievements or milestones in advancing sustainability objectives? Thank you. Thank you. So the question is three-pronged. Governance issues, social issues, environmental issues, all under sustainability. Let's look at the social issues. Saladin, that's why I called you first. So if you could take the floor. What are the partnership with UN and what are you addressing uh, with the UN agencies and which one? Give them credit. And the next one will be Florence. Thank you, James. Uh, we have been working with the UN on a number of programs. Uh, particularly focusing on supporting vulnerable and marginalized households. Uh, we look at uh, cautioning the households from uh, socioeconomic shocks and stressors, such as drought, uh, forced food displacement, in which case we are dealing with refugees, uh, old age, uh, and so on. So within that, uh, what we do is um, facilitating access to cash-based assistance or cash transfers, uh, through technology be means uh, that then foster ease of access, uh, dignity in terms of ensuring that the beneficiaries are served uh, as opposed to where uh, vulnerable households would be supported, say, through in-kind assistance where they queue to get food rations. Uh, we provide technologies where then they access that uh, support through bank accounts. So that serves as an entry point to formal banking uh, systems. Uh, but within that, we walk a journey with them, a journey then that facilitates uh, their transition from systemic reliance on humanitarian aid to self-reliance or economic independence. So we are working with the likes of uh, the World Food Program, uh, UNHCR, uh, which get us to refugees. We are working with IFAD, we are working with FAO, with UNICEF, uh, UNDP, and, and many others within the UN ecosystem. 
how many households? Uh, so we, had, we are supporting about 5.4 million households across the region. 5.4 million households being supported socially uh, through safety nets. Uh, Eric. Okay, Florence, come first. It looks like Eric is not ready. Quick uh, two minutes or so. As for guarantees is the government and uh, Dr. James mentioned about Kilimo Bihashara. It has been one of the long-standing partnerships that we've had to promote um, food security and work with smallholder farmers. Um, other than the government, then the other like-minded uh, partners we have is NORAD. NORAD is currently supporting us in the blue economy, uh, in the marine litter space, in climate adaptation. We are also working with MasterCard Foundation uh, to look at also how we support smallholder farmers in particular value chains. Uh, highlighted is grain, horticulture, and livestock. Um, we are also working with Propaco uh, to look at climate resilient agriculture. And we are also working uh, how to see how we can include women and youth because these are uh, critical actors in the food system space who need to be uh, capacitated and de-risked because we know access to finance in agriculture has been 
uh, considered minimal. The industry uh, um, reports about 3%. And as you have heard, we want to take our access to finance, especially for agriculture, to contribute 30%. So this needs to be de-risked, and this needs to be capacitated. Eric. Thank you very much, Florence. Uh, Eric deals with UNEP, Habitat. Uh -huh. Thank you, James. I think in addition to what uh, uh, Florida said, we are working with UNDP on clean energy transitions. Uh, UNDP is helping up uh, with proof of concept, especially transitioning schools uh, to clean energy. Uh, we are working with UNICEF on water. Uh, especially looking at marginalized counties and how we can do, uh, we can utilize underground water. So we have created a partnership with UNICEF. I think the others, uh, uh, Florence have talked about IFAD, what we are doing on climate resilience within uh, agricultural food systems. Uh, UN Habitat as well, uh, because we are also looking at what we can do in slums uh, in terms of greening, uh, the slums, reducing pollution, and, and water pollution, especially in, in the slum areas. Thank Talk you, James. Talk briefly about energy for uh, tree planting and uh, household empowerment. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, we started the, the environmental program uh, conservation uh, in 2019. Today, we have planted uh, 25.2 million trees. And through technology, we are now able to tell where every tree is and how it is doing. And this year, we've started on mangrove restoration uh, in the coast because we think that's why we can create significant impact in terms of uh, restoration of the, of, of the marine uh, ecosystems. On the, at the household level, um, that's where we have the highest burden uh, in terms of uh, cooking and, and lighting. And we have a program called Ecomoto that uh, together with our partners, IFC and others, we are solarizing and bringing clean cooking technologies and water to households uh, so that then they are able to access clean energy for cooking, lower the emissions. Today we lose 23,000 people every year in Kenya because of pollution in our kitchens. And that's what we are trying to, to fight with our partners through clean cooking, clean water, uh, and access to solar energy at the household level. As Jim said in the beginning, we have reached 450,000 households, and uh, we quickly want to accelerate that through technology to reach a million households in Kenya and in the region. Uh, briefly about Camry and uh, the research on uh, school kitchens and uh, the, the project of uh, transitioning schools to uh, LPGs. Thank you, thank you, and James. Briefly about the research finding with uh, University of uh, University of? of of Liverpool. Very good. Yeah, we partnered with uh, University of Liverpool uh, and Cambridge to understand the disease burden within our institutions and within our households uh, that use solid biomass for cooking and. We've studied about 232 schools, and the results that we found are quite shocking. The recommended levels of pollution by the World Health Organization we are also working with is that a five micrograms per cubic meter of air. 35 micrograms. In some schools, we are seeing 20,000. 20,000 20, micrograms. How you can imagine. The, and that explains why we are obsessed by ensuring the 8,000 transit. It's not a habitable environment, but that's what our cooks in schools are subjected to. You see, even in the fields, in those schools, the dust particles, smoke particles, concentration reaches 3,000. Yeah. It's a standard one for one kids. Now you can imagine the exposure uh, of their health. Let's continue. Yeah, and we're doing this to bring the, the health conversation in, into environment. 
uh, because we've been pitching our story from an environmental protection perspective. But we want to tell the government and policy makers that use of biomass is a significant health issue. We are carrying a huge disease burden. We have gone to schools where cooks have born, gone blind uh, because of uh, smoke. Uh, and therefore, we want to use that data to inform policy, to inform investments uh, by the government, by our donors, in terms of fast tracking the clean cooking conversation as part of our climate change uh, action. I told you equity is no longer a bank. It's more than a bank. Look at it, we are now informing health policies, the way we used wings to fly to inform education policies and change the entire uh, structure. Thank you very much, Eric. Reshima, what has been left out? Sustainability holistically. Thank you, James, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Reshma Shah, I'm Head of Sustainability. Um, so not to repeat anything that's been said, but just to add a few other areas where we're working with the UN. Uh, but one of the main ones is um, all kind of private companies join the UN Global Compact. Um, so we are also a member of the UN Global Compact, uh, where we drive some of the private sector initiative. But in addition to that, not just the UN Global Compact Kenya network, um, but we are also established with the UN, the Africa Business Leaders Coalition, which is um, for all African CEOs in the private sector, of which Dr. Mwangi um, is uh, chairing that um, ABLC. In addition to that, um, we're also working with UNEP, so the environmental uh, program for the UN, um, primarily around nature, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we have become an early adopter of the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure, TNFD. Uh, we are also working with UNEPFI, which is the financial institution sector of the environmental program, and we are part of the working group that's looking at how to transition banks and their clients into a net zero position. Um, in addition to that, um, we are also working with the UNFCCC, so the climate champions of the UN, and a big part of that deliverable was what we did with them in COP28. Um, where there was a significant presence um, of equity representing not just the uh, financial sector in Africa, but private sector um, in Africa as well. So those are some of the other areas where we're working with the UN. John, what else uh, is the foundation doing with the UN that might have been left out? Okay, um, thank you, Dr. James. I think uh, in addition to sum it up is to say that the way we collaborate uh, across the foundation is that number one, in terms of uh, how we target our work is that we want to look at the UN SDGs as one of the ways in which we can uh, set down our targets in terms of what we'd like to achieve across the foundation. So what we've done is to map the UN SDGs to uh, the work of the various pillars and you'll find that there's very close alignment in terms of the goals and then the targets. And then uh, beyond that, we also look at the countries where we operate and we say, let's look at their uh, national priorities, how they've set, set them up, such as in Kenya, um, the bigger picture is the, the Vision 2030, but as well as the current government's uh, priorities. And then partnerships is a key one for us because you've had my colleagues talk about the various partners that we work with. So of course, we've talked about the UN, we've talked about the governments where we operate in, and then partners who are trying to achieve the same kind of work that we're doing. So we believe if we collaborate, we're able to scale the work that we're doing rather than replicate. And then I think to sum all that up is that uh, within the foundations board, the Equity Group Foundation board, we do have a UN seat on it, which is currently uh, occupied by the UN uh, Residence Coordinator for Kenya, Dr. Stephen Jackson. Thank you. So Dr. Jackson sits on the board of uh, Equity Group Foundation just to ensure alignment of our collaboration and uh, um, closer monitoring of outline. Last three is to say all the 17 uh, sustainable goals have been mapped around the African recovery and resilient uh, plan so that uh, each of the six verticals then take care of the appropriate goals. So they are completely mapped. So it's all uh, like uh, 
by executing the African recovery and resilience plan, we are uh, executing the UN mandate on sustainable development goals. Joy, uh, maybe you could play a little bit uh, on the role we are playing globally on uh, climate and uh, sustainability. Joy is our group director of communication and uh, plays on uh, a lot on my daily on global, global service. Uh, thank you, James, and thank you for the question. Um, I think that climate and sustainability are actually redefining the brand that we have globally and how we are, as a private sector player, really looking to support not only what the United Nations is doing in terms of their uh, agenda here in the region, um, but what we can do as a private sector to support Africa's industrialization and growth, clean and green. One of the things that we did during the Africa Climate Summit that was held here in Nairobi last September is we recognized in the program that there was not a private sector voice. And so we quickly mobilized uh, through our own networks, working with ALN, working with the Commonwealth, um, a private sector declaration that actually laid out uh, activities that the private sector could accomplish to support climate and sustainability mitigation. Um, and so I think that we are looking for opportunities with our partners, uh, but really through the private sector to support climate mitigation and, uh, and to do it sustainably as Africa industrializes and grows over the next 20, 30 years. Our uh, partnership with UN on climate and environment um, I, I think that what we're doing with the United Nations is to really, um, we have the same goals and we have the same values. So as the United Nations works on its development agenda, as the countries that we operate in work on their development agenda, we are together looking at ways to do that uh, sustainably across the East Africa region. UAE. Uh, the UAE, we have been um, working with the COP28 Secretariat, with Reshma, myself, the foundation, um, on really trying to bring the sustainability agenda into, into our development. The UAE, I think you'll see as a leader um, going forward, and we've been working with the government there, um, with the sovereign wealth funds there, um, to really drive sustainable uh, development in this region. So as somebody said earlier, uh, we have taken uh, the issue of sustainability very, very seriously. I've been privileged uh, to have been appointed by the president of Kenya on his advisory. of African Business Leaders uh, Alliance to drive uh, the issue of sustainability for Africa. As I said, I shared the panel of private sector for the African Climate Summit, Nairo uh, Nairobi. I've been privileged uh, to be appointed by uh, King Charles III as uh, his co-chair of Sustainable Market Initiative and also uh, what used to be Prince Charles uh, uh, Trust. And all that we are focused on is on climate change. So I'm able to bring those capabilities. I have advice to UAE government uh, and with a focus on Africa. And broadly, we are working very closely with African governments. Uh, to make sure that uh, governments provide uh, leadership. Anything else you want? I think the only other thing I would say is that really as we try to champion and deliver on the Africa Recovery and Resilience Plan, um, we are really looking to work with UN agencies that are, that are in that space. So for instance, we're working with the WHO on, um, on actually how we create value chains for affordable medicines into the Equity Athia um, project. As we look to um, support value chain development, we're working with the WTO on, uh, on how to redirect supply chains 
uh, sustainably into Africa. And we, to the, the UAE uh, point, we recently were in the UAE at the WTO 13th uh, ministerial where James was an advisor to the ministers on, uh, on how to do that. So we're working very closely with the World Health Organization, Gavi for vaccination, so that uh, the, uh, the Equity Group Foundation, Equity Africa franchise, would be able to uh, be available uh, to use mitigation, particularly vaccination for free, and any service that the world would support the continent on. I'm glad that this week we opened the five Equity Africa uh, hospitals in DRC and hope by June will have opened uh, 30. So it is not a Kenyan issue, it's an African issue and that uh, answers to the question. Thank you very much. Now let's move to, the, uh, to uh, another question that has been asked online. So I'll be reading who uh, made it intended is and carefully this is yours. What proportion of NPLs were written off during the third and fourth quarter, and has, the form, uh, and has the formation of new NPLs peaked during quarter fourth, or should we expect further deterioration during year uh, 2024? Ronak uh, Gahia. Uh, the second question uh, is to Alvin. Could you please talk about uh, the significant drop in transaction volumes on Equitel and Equity More? We really analyzed already uh, the accounts. Uh, another question, maybe this comes to you. Uh, maybe or my, uh, just trying to understand why directors' emoluments increased by 80% year on year, despite the decline in profits. Can you talk about remuneration policy of directors? So Lydia Dirango, you can also help Mary. Um, uh, this other one is uh, to Brent and Kirube, Sam. Can you help us understand why the bank's cost of funding as in to 2011, uh, deposits and net income growth in constant currency terms. Uh, so, uh, Mary, you can take the seat, or Eric, you can start, and we are with Mary. So, Mary, do you want to go first? No, sure. May, go first. Take the seat. All right. Um, on the question of the proportion of loans written off, um, we wrote off about 22 billion um, in the year, largely in Q4. Um, as you can note, that, that would then reduce provisions and that would explain why our cost of risk has gone up to 4.4. So as we've highlighted before, we are committed to keeping our coverage um, relatively high to the industry and getting it back to where it was in the previous year, which is above 90. Um, have the NPLs peaked? Yes, we've been highlighting this from Q4 going into before we were in the closed period that yes, we, from the review of our loan book, from looking at the numbers that we have now, our NPLs have peaked. Um, you'll see we closed Q3 at 12.2. Um, we've closed the year at 11.7. Um, we do not see further significant deterioration coming in um, the way we've seen it in 2023. That being said, that ratio is likely to remain sticky. Um, we will, you've seen from our 2024 guidance, we hope to bring it to 9% to 11%. So it will, it will not significantly come down um, rapidly. They identify first and foremost with a vision and the mission of the institution, and they are willing to serve. So for them, it is really a service. And what we do is just to try to defray the cost of attendance, and uh, we pay a fixed allowance to them since 2007, irrespective of the entity that they serve. So whether you are in the group or in a subsidiary board, the allowances are the same and standardized according to the remuneration 
policy that has been set by the governance committee of the board. Now, so um, the increase can be attributed to uh, maybe one or two things, and I'm going to explain that now. Uh, as James has explained, we have grown the business uh, under the four uh, strategic uh, groups, that is technology, insurance, uh, banking, and the, of course the social uh, impact um, wing of the business or investment. Now, we got a lot of new directors coming in in the course of the end of 2022 uh, to support the insurance business, which was completely new, and they started earning their allowances basically last year, 2023. And then we have also now recruited a few other directors to supplement uh, that team in the equity life assurance company. And I think you will also see others coming in very soon to support the general, another line factor. We also planned because as James explained, the social engine is also taking a very prominent and a significant role in the business and the entire impact agenda of the group under the African Recovery and Resilience Plan. So that also explains, you see quite financials uh, coming up very, very soon. Now, the other explanation is the sheer number of meetings that have been happening to support the growth of the business. Uh, for instance, uh, last year, we had a lot more meetings than the four scheduled ones in the DRC, uh, because remember, we, were, we are still in the integration after the merger and uh, that called for a few more meetings than usual. Whether it's the committees, audit committee met several times uh, just to make sure that the internal controls are in place as the two institutions came together. Uh, I know also the governance met more times than normal than the scheduled four meetings a year. And of course the full board also met more times to give directions uh, to the team. In Rwanda also we had several extra meetings and in the group. Chami, yeah, very good. Give Chami the other mic. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mwangi. Uh, I've got a question on the risks. How, how do you differentiate between business risk and financial risk, considering that they are interrelated? And I have another observation I got from the presentation. Uh, the presentation reminded me of the quote from William Shakespeare, which says that, I quote, all the world's a stage, all men and women merely players. They have their exits and they have their entrances. And one man in his part plays many parts. Dr. Mwangi, equity group is up to the task. Thank you. Ah, thank you very much. It's really nice. I wish mean, uh, Chevy you allowed us to end there with a Shakespeare's uh, <laughs> uh, quote. That must be a 14th century. Yeah, but group group chairman. Yeah. Mimi are Mwisho, eh? Thank you, thank you, thank you, group CEO. Thank you, all your members, all your team. Now, I think I must be very happy today. Starting this meeting, from that time up to now, this is the only PLC, group PLC that has done that in Kenya. And Kenyans are the ones who are on the stock exchange. Thank you very much. And you have stood, you have not sat down, you have not taken any, any water from that time, so you are very strong. And uh, I think... Uh, you must be, I must pray for you to get another big job in Kenya. <laughs> uh, apart from all that now you are doing. And again, uh, group, group CEO, thank you for bringing us professionals from all over. Kenyans need other people. And they will work with them very well. Uh, Afia, how have you gone about in Busia County? 
half year because I think this, there are your branches. There, there are now two. Agriculture, I think, to touch us for agriculture, let us have a meeting that we can learn about agriculture, especially we shareholders who, have, who are here and other people, interested people. Because you know what you are saying is so much, it is really, it is really touching on the lives of Kenyans. And it will improve if we know what your professionals are telling us. I don't know how far you have gone with the affordable houses, whether your insurance is insuring those houses because they are in the government and you are near the government also. Uh, other countries, our countries that equity is 24%. And then uh, to improve on, on the equity PLC, we must, be, we must partner. We must assist you. You have got professionals assisting you. Shareholders also. When I went somewhere, I don't want to say now. Nah. And I said I'm a visitor. They said, of doctor. Doctor. Doctor Mwangi. Ah, they said, no, you are welcome. You are welcome. So, because you are known and you are going, growing high, uh, we, we need to follow your examples. And you'll also be calling us sometimes. We also talk to you in a private way because of exposing some things here is not good. It, that is not good uh, explanation of your experts, the ones you have chosen from all over, all over. I think all over the world. You have said Cairo, America, Botswana, UK, UK Thank you very much, uh, Uganda. You, 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 Uganda, I always go there, but I, I, I don't know that there's Afia there because I've been sick and not go to Afia, yeah, yeah, Afia, Afia Hospital. Uh, Zambia, Zambia, our friend, because we used to talk about the, our the former president who, who used to be there. He was very good, the former one. So, <laughs> so, so, I think so. Now we clap for you because somebody is clapping here. We just clap because you have stood, you have that. Let us now appreciate you very well and and uh, our chairman and the board and all the. Yes. So I think uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Asante Kijana. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, And also about training farmers in Busia uh, quickly. Thank you, Dr. Mwangi, and thank you, Mr. Adoisius Chami. We currently have an equity Afia uh, facility in Busia that's been operational now since last year, I think um, in November. So it's working well, and of course, being a very busy town, I think the facility is so far picking up very well. Yeah, on, on our training for farmers, as uh, Florence had earlier touched on, is that we anchor our offering as Equity Group Foundation through the branch. So we'll be able to do that. Uh, we currently do that as, uh, uh, through the equity bank that we have in Busia. And some of our offering, we've actually added now Equity AFI as one of our implementation rails for, for other programs as well. So that as we see them as, as we serve them as farmers, they also present to our facilities as uh, potential uh, um, customers as well at the medical centers. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. On, uh, the differentiation between financial and business risk and appropriately respond to Shakespeare's uh, <laughs> uh, uh, give a rejoinder. Um, I did mention that uh, financial risk is concerned with uh, liquidity, credit, uh, capital, market risk, and insurance risk and sometimes we include country risk. But the first five are risks that you find in our income statements, in our financial statements, the balance sheet and uh, income statement. Um, on the other hand, business risk is concerned with our competitive strategy. Uh, so here we're looking at uh, our customer acquisition strategy. We're looking at our products and the uh, customer value proposition or unique value proposition that we offer through our products and services. Uh, we're also looking at our distribution, so branches, digital channels, ATMs, and so on and so forth. 
uh, finally uh, and uh, financial um, and uh, business risks we also pay attention to the external environment and how it changes and what opportunities uh, those changes uh, throw up for us and also risks that we need to manage these include legal uh, economic political, environmental, social, technological, regulatory, and so on and so forth. Um, so I don't have, uh, uh, the, for Shakespeare, I could ask to be or not to be. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And where is uh, Brad Risk and Reputation Risk? Um, Reputational risk is one of the uh, 16 principal risk types that we manage, one of the most important. Uh, but the business risks I've spoken to, including brand risk, we cover under strategic risk, under the umbrella of strategic risk. So strategic and reputational risk are part of the 16 principal risk types that we uh, manage, uh, both on a proactive, forward-looking, as well as... Uh, yeah, was light. Uh, to the best of my knowledge. Um, but let me uh, close by saying what a privilege I had this morning uh, in answering those questions. As you saw, I never attempted even one. You give me an opportunity to answer the question you never asked about the depth and breadth uh, of the leadership and management capability in this bank. It is not the numbers that are good. It's the leaders and managers in this group that are great. We have a great board. Uh, we have a great leaders, and you can see how they take the questions. They don't need to be prepared. Uh, just direct the question to them. That depth of leadership, that competence and capability is what has brought this bank where it is. And as Shakespeare said, each of them is playing their role when their time comes, like I do. And so we have really answered um, another question. How far can this group go? This group can go as far as that capability has been demonstrated. It's not a Kenyan capability. It's a global capability. We recognize and appreciate that we have become a global brand, a global company, the second strongest brand, banking brand on earth, but only happens to have our headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya, Africa. But this group could be anywhere. So, Chemi, I was humbled by your acknowledgement that the strategy and the policy of opening positions in the leadership and management be globalized because it will be naive for us to think we can build uh, a global brand alone. So the, your call for partnership, collaboration, and support, we embrace it with open hands. And as Shekia says, let each of them, uh, when their time comes, uh, play their role. And when their time uh, ends, uh, Shakespeare closes by saying what? Absolute. So I'm grateful to have had this opportunity. I've uh, tested your patience. I've seen how resilient you are. None of you have, have left. You have not even walked out. So allow me to invite our group chair, because he has been called out. His board has been talked about, uh, Professor Masharia. For those who may not know Professor Masharia, this is a uh, professor in medicine. Um, an ENT surgeon, and so we are pre um, privileged to have him, and we learn a lot from him, the precision of medicine. We seem the same precision in business. Uh, Professor Mashara, thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, Shakespeare also said that uh, the good, the evil that men do lives after them, and the good that they do is interred with their bones. So our role is to make sure that we minimize the evil that we do, because that is what will be remembered after we go. Thank you, uh, good morning, and uh, I, I want first to thank all of you for your patience. It's been a long morning. 
um, I want to congratulate the management of equity uh, group for the uh, very good results for last year. And at the same time, thank all our stakeholders who have brought us where we are and who have continued uh, to show their confidence in us. I think I need not talk much about the group. Uh, this morning, uh, James has amply demonstrated the great capability at the corporate office through the people that he has, uh, has answered your questions. I hope that they have answered them satisfactorily. And that display of the capability is really to uh, buttress the fact that the group is very well positioned, has prepared very well for the diversification that was presented and for our expansion and for the development of an integrated financial services group uh, in this region. The board has lived to its mandate of oversight, uh, both through guidance to the management, through interrogation of the strategy and making sure that uh, strategy execution in equity group is not only timely, it is disciplined and it is efficient. And that is what has brought us here. We have spent uh, great resources to make sure that uh, in our next phase, as we expand, that um, our house is not built on shifting sand and our house has a very solid uh, foundation. We, I, can, I can say without fear, any fear of contradiction here that the, uh, the outlook for equity group is bright and it is great based on um, our strategy, our geographical footprints, our business model, and our operational uh, uh, excellence uh, leveraging on technology. The board commits itself to the best uh, uh, corporate governance practices benchmarked on global corporations. In this regard, the board subjects itself to regular governance audits over and beyond the regulatory requirement, and all these audits have uh, given us frying A's in our uh, governance structures. I want to urge you, those of you who are uh, stakeholders in various levels, whether investors, whether shareholders, to make sure that you really take your appropriate stake in equity group, because this group will be flying. At 40 years, we have learned from our past. We have uh, become stable, just like a middle-aged adult uh, is in that position where they start making very well informed decisions. They don't make rash decisions. They consider the risks and they manage those risks prudently. That is where we are as equity group. I thank you once again for your patience and for your attendance. Asante Nisana. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as we invite our colleagues so that we can do the, we can close the investors' briefing with the anthem, we want to remind those who are following that uh, the investor briefing a booklet for the full year together with the financial statements and the press release are available online on our group website. And for those who are here, kindly pick your copy as you live. And uh, we look forward to, to a great year. And for those who still have questions, kindly post them online. Our investor relations team will respond to them. I want to invite Sister Teresa to close for us with a heart of prayer. Then we'll do the equity anthem. And then we'll have one or two photos and we'll continue with the, with the breakfast. Thank you, Sister Teresa. But once again, thank you for coming and, and for the members of the Fourth Estate, we are very grateful for your support, Sister Teresa. As we close our meeting, 
I'm going to read Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. we thank you, God, for the gift of this day. We thank you for the wonderful work that you have enabled our management to do. We present ourselves unto you that you may continue guiding us, that as we continue to serve our people, your people, we may continue to scale up. We thank you for the many times we have wind awards. We thank you for our leadership. We thank you for Dr. James Mwangi and all those who are supporting her, him. We thank you for our stakeholders that Lord you may bless each one of them. As we continue to serve you, we pray for peace. We pray for resources that you, people may come up to support us so that we can envision your goodwill that you started in, in Equity Bank. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We can be upstanding for the equity anthem. The lyrics will be on the screen so we can join the equity team. Oh, yeah, boy. 
we still have some refreshments but we'll kindly take some photos